All right, so we've created our notes page, which is kind of the home page for our application as we've seen. So the next thing that we're gonna create is gonna be our note detail page. Now recall that when we set this page up in our routes, we used this URL parameter here to make sure that this page would be able to display different notes depending on which note the user had clicked. So, you know, if the user clicks on this note, we'll see that that turns into one, two, three. So what this page is gonna have to do is find the note with that ID, if it exists, and display its details inside the page. So what that's gonna look like, the first thing we're gonna have to do in order to get the value of the URL parameter is we're gonna need to import something called useParam. And this is a hook provided by the React Router DOM package that allows us to, as I said, get the value of URL parameters in React. So we'll say import useParams from React Router DOM. And the way that we're gonna get the value of that parameter is by saying const params equals use params. And the name of that param is the same name that we gave to it inside the route string, right? That's going to be note ID. And the way that we can do that is by saying const note ID equals params. And yes, we can condense this a little bit if we remove this and just put this use params thing after this, we can remove the params variable like that and take care of that in one line. So we have the ID of the note. So the next question is how do we actually get the array of notes so that we can find the note with this ID? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to allow this note detail page to take all of the notes as a prop. And essentially what it's gonna do then is filter through those, find the note with this ID and display its details. Now this isn't the only way to do it, right? We could do the filtration logic inside the routes component if we wanted to, or as we're gonna do later on, we could use context in our application. But for now, what we're gonna do is just take this as a prop since that's what we were doing in our notes page. So while we're thinking about it, let's go back to our routes component and we're gonna pass the notes prop to our note detail page, just like we did to our notes page here as well. So we'll say notes equals fake notes. And that should be it. All right, so the way that we're going to find the note with the matching ID now is by saying const note, and we're gonna say equals notes.find, and we want to find the note whose ID is equal to the note ID URL parameter. All right, simple as that, we now have the note that matches. So the next thing we're gonna do is inside this H1 heading, instead of displaying this as a note, which isn't super useful to be honest, what we're gonna display instead is the notes title. So we'll say note.title. Under that we'll say paragraph and we'll display the notes content. For now, we're just gonna display it as regular content, right? We're not going to render the markdown yet. We'll see how to do that later. And underneath that, what we're gonna do is add a button which will allow us to edit the note. Now we're gonna look at how this will work a little later on. So. For now, we're just kind of mocking out this page still. And then we have to wrap this in React Fragments, since again, we're not allowed to return more than one top-level element from a React component. Cool, so let's see if this works the way we have it set up so far. What we should see is if we go back to notes one, two, three, we should see the title of the note, which is my first note. We should see the content of the note, which contains markdown here that isn't being rendered still. And we have this edit button here, okay? So the next thing that we're gonna do, and we're not gonna carry this logic all the way through to the end yet, but what we're gonna do inside this note detail page is we're going to add a state variable which will allow the user to enter and exit editing mode. So essentially when the user is in editing mode, what that's gonna look like is, as I said earlier, this is going to turn into a text input. This is gonna turn into probably a text area and this button will change into a save button, okay? And that'll basically be how the user is allowed to edit the contents and title of each note. So in order to do that, what we're gonna have to do is import the use state hook from React. So we'll say import use state from React. And down here, we're gonna create a state variable called is editing. Now what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say const is editing and set is editing. And we're gonna say equals use state and the initial value for this is going to be false. Okay, 
because the user, when they first go to that page, is just gonna want to view the note. They're not gonna wanna edit it unless they actually click that edit button. So what this edit button has to do now is uh, we'll say on click, and that's going to set the is editing state variable to true. So when this button is clicked, we're gonna say set is editing to true. And now what we have to do is we have to take a look at this is editing state variable when deciding what to actually display on this page. So essentially what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say if is editing, and we're gonna define a completely different interface, completely different elements that will be returned from this component if the user is editing, right? That's how we'll achieve the effect of switching between text inputs and just regular HTML elements. So if the user's editing, what the component is gonna look like instead is we're gonna say, first of all, we'll have to put this inside uh, React Fragments just like we did down here. And we're gonna display a text input with the notes title in it. So we'll say input, the value of this input is going to be the notes title. So we'll say note.title. And in the on change, whenever this is changed, we're gonna have to do something else, which I'll show you how to do shortly. For now, we're just gonna put in an empty function there. Okay, and for the placeholder for this input, right in case that's blank, we'll say enter a title. Now under that, we're gonna have the text area, which is where the user will be able to edit the notes content. And what that's gonna look like is we're gonna say placeholder, type your note here. For the value, we're going to display the notes content. And for on change, we're just gonna leave that as an empty function right now. We'll come back in a minute and I'll show you how that's actually gonna work. All right, so we have our two inputs. The next thing we're gonna add is the save button, which will basically do the inverse of this edit button. So what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say button. The text of that button is gonna be save changes. We're probably also gonna to want to have a cancel button here. We'll just say button and this one will say cancel. And for now, these buttons are just gonna do the same exact thing. They're just gonna switch the is editing variable back to false. So we'll say on click. Let's try that again. There we go. On click equals set is editing to false. And same thing for our save changes button. We're gonna say on click equals set is editing to false. All right, so let's go have a look at how this page is gonna work. If we click on edit now, what we'll see is that it changes these things to a text input and a text area, which are very ugly right now. They don't have any styling, right? That's something we'll add a little later on. But the point is that this works, right? We have these text inputs both correctly populated with the data that is in the note. So the next thing that we're gonna do, and by the way, if you click on save changes or cancel, that will take you back to the non-editing state of the note detail page. The next thing that we're gonna do is see how to actually track the values, right? Track the changes that we have inside of here. Essentially what we're gonna have to do in order to allow ourselves to cancel if we want to, is instead of modifying the actual content and title properties on this note here, which isn't something that you wanna do in React because the DOM won't update correctly in that case, we're gonna say const, and we're gonna create two different state variables which will keep track of the values inside the input and text area. So here's what those are gonna look like. We're gonna say const title value, or you know what, we'll say something like uh, updated title and set updated title equals use state. The initial value of that is going to be the title value of this note. So we can say note.title. And if we wanna provide a backup value for that, we can say or empty string. And then we'll do the same thing for our updated content. We'll say updated content and set updated content equals use state note dot content or empty string. Okay, so now inside the input and text area that we have here, we just have to display updated title as the value and on change, we're going to set that updated title state variable to whatever the current value in that input is. So we'll say e.target.value, and we'll have to do e inside the arguments for this on change function. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the content text area. We're gonna say uh, updated content, 
just like that. And inside on change, we're gonna have to modify this function to say e set updated content e.target.value. All right, so we now have two new state variables that will keep track of any changes we make to the input and text area. And the idea here, which we're not gonna do quite yet, but I'll just uh, draw out the skeleton of it, I suppose. The idea here is that we're gonna have a function inside our note detail page called something like save changes. And what this is gonna do is take the values of updated title and updated content and update whatever note this is to have those values instead. Okay, now this is something that's going to be a little more complicated. We're going to have to have some kind of uh, some kind of other prop function that we can call inside our note detail page to make that happen. But for now, we'll just say something like we'll just display an alert saying saving changes. And we'll set the uh, is editing back to false. So we'll say set is editing false. And then from our save button, what we're going to do is just say on click, save changes. And for our cancel button, in addition to setting is editing to false, we're gonna have to reset the updated title and updated content values back to the notes title and content, okay? Since we decided we wanted to discard those changes. So what we're gonna do there, we just have to say set is editing false. And above that, we'll say set updated title to note.title and set updated content to note.content. All right, so let's take a look at what this will do. We're gonna come back here, click on edit. We'll just change the title here and change the content here. If we click save changes now, we'll see the alert that says saving changes. And it's not actually going to persist those changes yet because we haven't added that logic. But the point here is that it will set those things to that correct value, right? If we uh, click on edit again, we'll see that those values are still there because they're persisted inside our component's state for the time being. On the other hand, if we click cancel, right, if we want to uh, get rid of those new values that we've added and just set that back to the original values on the note, we can see that if we go back now, it'll have the correct title and content from before. All right, so that's how that's all gonna work. That's pretty much all of the logic we need to add for the time being to our note detail page. Oh, except there is one more thing, and that is we need to add some logic for dealing with the case where this note doesn't exist. Because currently, if we put in an ID of a note that doesn't exist and hit enter, we'll get an error because uh, we haven't actually added any error handling logic to that case. So what this is gonna look like is once we find our note from the notes array, we're gonna have to add an if statement. And actually, let's add this down here underneath save changes. We're gonna add an if statement that checks to make sure that that note exists and returns some kind of other page or other elements if it doesn't. So for that, we're just gonna say if not note, right? If the note doesn't exist, we're gonna return. And what we can return, there's a few things we can return. One thing to return would just be you know, a basic error message. We could say something like, nope, that note doesn't exist, right? Something like that. But what I'm gonna recommend you do is either display the not found page from our application. So you could say return not found page, or even better, what you could do is create another not found page specifically for when a note isn't found by the ID, right? It kind of helps to have a different not found page for when a user's trying to access a specific instance of a resource than when the user just went to a page that no longer exists in our application. All right, so what I'm gonna recommend you do, as I said, is create a new page, which we'll call the note not found page. And what we're gonna do for that is just copy our not found page and change the text a little bit. So we'll change this one over to say something like, uh-oh, looks like that note no longer exists. All right, and then we don't have to add any other message here. We can just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just display that message as the only thing for now. All right, so back on our note detail page, we could, instead of importing the not found page, we're gonna import the note not found page and return that here. And now if we try and go to a page that doesn't exist, 
Oops. We're going to need to change the import path here as well. Note not found page. And if we refresh this now, ah, we need to actually change the name of the component. This should be note not found page. Third time's a charm. Let's try refreshing this now. Oops. Okay. One more thing we have to do is we actually have to add a backup value if this note doesn't exist, right? We're already saying note.title, but if note doesn't exist, that's going to throw an error in JavaScript. So what we're going to do is say note and note.title. That'll make sure that the note exists before trying to access the title. And we'll say note and note.content as well, or empty string. All right, let's try this again. And sure enough, we see that it says, uh-oh, looks like that note no longer exists. So that's pretty much all we need to do for our note detail page. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Now that we've set up the basic framework, so to speak, of our note sharing application, right? Pages, routing, components, etc. The next thing that we're going to take a look at how to do is modify the data of our application so that it's no longer static, right? Currently, it's just static data that's being passed down to all of our components. And while that looks pretty good and it allowed us to actually build out all of our components in some detail, the next step, of course, is to allow those components to actually modify that data so that we can do things like create new notes, update notes, delete notes, etc. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at here today. So that's our plan of attack. Let's jump right in. All right, so the next step that we're gonna take in our application, we've already created the basics of most of the important pages in our app, such as the uh, note detail page, which displays the details of the notes and allows us to edit them, and the notes page, which displays lists of notes. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is make it so that instead of just displaying static data, right, our notes page and note detail page currently just display static data from inside our routes.js file, what we're going to do is make it so that these components can actually make changes to this data and do things like create notes, delete notes, and update notes as well. Now there's a few ways we could go about this. One way to do it would be to add a use state hook to our routes component and have these notes be expressed as a state variable. And then we would just basically pass those notes down to all of the components that needed them. Now this would allow all of our different pages to share that data. Since again, that data would be contained up here in routes. So, you know, whenever we changed pages, each new page would have access to the same data as all of the other pages. However, a slightly better course of action, in my opinion, would be to use context, right? Because just to review what context does exactly in a React app, context basically allows us to, you know, instead of having our component tree look like this with the app component, in this case, we have our routes component like this. And having the rest of our components down here, right? One page, another page, another page, etc. Without context, what we would have to do, as I said, is we would have to have the state contained in our routes component and passed down as props to all of our pages, right? And our pages would also then have to accept props, which would allow them to modify that state, right? functions essentially from inside routes that would allow them to modify those things. With context, however, what our components can do is basically have something that's outside of the normal component tree that they can share data through, right? So this is a normal component tree right here. If we have context over here on the side, right, we'll have some kind of context. Our components can actually access the state of this using the use context hook as we saw, right? So in other words, their parent component doesn't have to store and manage that state for them. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use context to manage all of the notes for our application. And this will allow us to do things like delete notes, add notes, modify notes, etc. Okay, so that's our plan. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to create a notes context. 
So first of all, what I like to do is usually create a new folder that I keep my contexts in called contexts. And inside here, we're gonna create a new file which we'll call notes context.js. Okay, now remember that in React, the way that we create a new context is by simply using the create context function. So we're gonna say import create context from React. And then we're gonna say export const notes context equals create context. And we'll just call that with no value passed to it. All right, and remember that the way that we use this context is something like this. Inside a very high level component, such as our app component or our routes component, I'll just use our app component for demonstration here. The way that we allow our components to access that context is by saying import notes context from contexts slash notes context. And we actually have to wrap all of the components that we want to have access to the current value of that context inside what's called a provider of that context. So the way that we do that, we just say notes context dot provider and wrap all of the components that we want to have access to that context value inside of that. Okay, so in this case, everything inside routes, including routes itself, would now be able to access the value which we can pass as a prop here of this context, All right? So if we were to say value and do the string hello, this would allow all of the components inside of here to access this value using the use context hook, right? This is something that we saw when we first learned about context in React. So that's the basic syntax and strategy for doing that. But what I usually like to do, and this is something that we saw in the friend tracker application as well, if you haven't seen that, I'd recommend you go back and take a look at that. What I usually like to do is create a separate component that will actually encapsulate all of the logic for the context and take care of storing its data, right? Because when the data inside a context can change, that means that we have to involve a use state hook. Uh, we have to create our own functions, which will take care of managing the state in that use state hook, et cetera. You'll see what I mean in just a second if you're not familiar with this. So essentially what we're gonna do is I'm gonna create a new folder, which I'll call providers, okay? And this is going to contain special components that encapsulate the logic for our contexts. Now, in reality, you probably could just put the different components that I'm gonna create inside of here inside the contexts, but you know, why not keep things more separated? It's always much easier to combine things if we find that there's not really any use in that division than separating things after the fact. So. Let's create a new file inside providers, and this is gonna be called notesprovider.js. And what this is gonna do, we're gonna start off by importing the notes context up here. And I need to change the quotation marks there. For some reason, my IDE is set up to use double quotes instead of single quotes. And we're gonna say export const notes provider. And what this component is gonna do is take all of the children that we put in between its JSX tags, right? So in other words, we're gonna display this like notes provider and have a bunch of stuff inside of here, right? What we're gonna do is use the children prop in React, which we've seen earlier, to make the context available to all of the components inside the JSX tags, as I said. So what this is gonna look like we're gonna first of all say return, and we're gonna use the notes context dot provider, which I showed you earlier. So notes context dot provider. And inside here, we're just going to display all of the child components in between the JSX tags using the curly braces and the children prop. All right, so the next thing we need to do is pass the value prop to this context that all of the children components will be able to access. And again, because we want this to be able to change, we're gonna need to use a state variable for this. So let's start off here by importing the use state hook from React. And we're gonna create a state variable called notes here and set notes. And the initial value for that is going to be the fake notes thing that we had inside our routes. What I'm gonna do is actually remove those from here. Well, for now I'll just copy and paste them, but we will be removing this shortly. We're gonna paste it inside our notes provider and this will be the starting value for our notes. Okay, so uh, we'll say use state, starting value is gonna be fake notes. 
And that's our state variable. Now, in order to make these notes available to all of the components inside this provider, we're gonna just say value and we're gonna pass an object as this value, which we'll say notes. Okay, so the way that components are gonna actually access this is gonna be something like this. I'm just gonna type it out here, but they'll say something like const notes equals use context, and then they'll have to say notes context like that. That's what it'll look like essentially. So that's why this notes thing is inside a an object because we're gonna want to also pass other functions and other data management things like, uh, for example, if we want to allow a component to delete a note, we'll allow them to have access to a function like this, which we'll have to pass through the value from inside this notes provider. You'll see what I mean if uh, you're not familiar with that shortly. But the next thing we're gonna do is now that we have this notes provider, we're just going to allow our components to access it. The first thing we're gonna have to do for that is we're gonna have to import our notes provider component into our app component by saying import notes provider from providers notes provider. And we're gonna wrap all of the components in our application inside this notes provider by saying notes provider and putting our routes, which contains all of the components so far for our application inside of there. All right, so that should allow our components to access that context. So let's go into our page components, which are currently accepting notes as a prop. Okay, so if we take a look at these things here, notes, fake notes, we're actually going to delete that prop and have our page components access the notes directly through context. So I'm gonna delete this fake notes thing up here as well. And then let's just open up our notes page and note detail pages. Notes page, note detail page, oops, there we go. And we're going to have them access their notes through context. Now, the first step in this, as you may recall, is by using the use context hook. Right, we're importing that from React. And then we're going to remove the notes prop and instead say const notes equals use context. And for that, we have to actually import the notes context as well. So we can say import notes context from dot dot slash contexts slash notes context. Okay, and then we just have to pass that context as an argument to our use context hook. We'll say notes context. And that's all we need to do. So the same thing now is going to apply to our note detail page. So we'll do the same exact thing. We're just gonna say import use context from React. Import our notes context from its file. Okay, and I'll put that down there. There we go. And we're going to remove the notes prop here and replace that with context. So we'll say const notes equals use context notes context. And that should be it. So everything now should work just as before if we did everything right. Let's try this by running it. We're gonna say npm run start and we should see the exact same functionality that we had before in our app except that all of this logic, right, all of the notes data is encapsulated inside a context provider. So let's actually just uh, go to notes here for now. Oops, just notes is what I want, there we go. And sure enough, we'll see that our notes are displayed just like before, we have my notes shared with me, and if we click on view, that'll take us to the note detail page. If we click on edit, right, everything is working exactly the same way as it was before, except as I've already said, it's using context behind the scenes. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've moved all of our note data into a context provider, the next thing we're gonna do is see how to allow ourselves to create new notes. All right, now the first step in this, of course, is gonna be actually adding a button for that. And to do that, we're gonna go into our notes page, which is right here, and we're going to add a button underneath our My Notes list. And actually, we're gonna delete this shared with me list since that's not gonna be a part of our application quite yet. Right, that'll come after we actually add user authentication, that kind of thing to our app. And what we're gonna do now is, this button is going to say, 
uh, create, or you know what, we'll say add a new note with the little plus sign in front of it, because for some reason that's what new buttons always look like in websites. And what we're gonna want this button to do, and if you recall from when I first sketched out the basic flow of our app, what we're gonna want this button to do is not immediately create a new note, but instead we're gonna want it to display a modal that asks the user for the name of the new note, right? So that whatever the title should be. So what this is gonna have to do, and we're gonna have to create a modal component for this, which should be pretty straightforward. We're gonna create a modal component that will look something like this. It'll just have a text input and a button. The text input will take the title of the, uh, of the new note, and this button will actually be what triggers the creation of that new note. Okay, so right away, Let's create a new modal component here. Inside our components folder, we're gonna say new file. We're gonna create a file called modal.js. And this modal component is gonna look pretty similar to the modal that we've created elsewhere in other videos. But just in case you haven't seen those, I'm gonna just walk you through real quick how this is going to work. So we're gonna say export const modal. And this modal is gonna take a few props, the first one being a prop that specifies whether or not the modal is currently visible, right? We can actually change this to something like is open. And we're also going to add an on request close prop, which the modal will call when the user does something that should cause the modal to close. All right, so the, the idea with this modal is that it's a controlled modal. That's just the term for it in React. It's a controlled modal, which means that its parent component is gonna be the one that takes care of displaying it and not displaying it. So we have is open on request close. The last prop that we're gonna to need to get is the children prop. And this children prop is going to allow us to pass children to the modal inside the JSX tags. You'll see what that looks like in a minute when we use it. But basically what we're gonna do is if the is open prop is false, right? So if not is open, we're gonna just return null from this component, so nothing will be rendered whatsoever. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is display our modal component with the children inside of it. This is gonna be the first time that we add some styling to our app, because this is gonna have to uh, actually look good in order to be a modal. We're gonna say div, and we're gonna give this div a class name. Now, the class name of this div is gonna be modal background, and this will be the sort of black or dark gray backdrop that this modal will have while it's open, right? Letting the user know that they can't interact with the rest of the page at that time. Now, after that, we're also going to say on click, and when this modal background element is clicked, it's going to call this on request close prop that's being passed to it from its parent component. So we'll say on click, this is going to say uh, on request close, we're just going to pass that directly through. And that's our div, okay? So again, that div is going to be the dark gray background of our modal. And I'm drawing it in white here because I'm already on a dark background, but essentially that's going to be this part here behind the modal. And when the user clicks on it, it's going to close the modal. That's just some basic functionality that most modals on most websites have, okay? Now inside this div, we're going to display the modal body that's going to be the actual container of the modal content. And for this one, we're gonna use a div as well. The class name of this one is going to be modal body. And when this one is clicked, what we're gonna do is say E and say event.stop propagation. What that will do is it'll keep events inside the modal, like clicks, from propagating up and affecting components outside the modal. This is a problem, as you might recall, when we first took a look at modals in React. If you haven't seen that, that's why I'm going through it here. So anyway, that's going to be the modal body container. Inside here now is where we're actually gonna to start to display the content. Now, the first thing we're gonna display here is going to be the top bar of the modal body. This is gonna be where we actually have a button to close the modal, right? So eventually we'll make this a nice little X button like that. For the time being, we're just gonna have a button uh, that'll say close on it. And this will be the element that we're displaying, right? The top bar, so to speak, of our modal uh, container. So we're gonna have a div for that, just like with our others. And the class name of this div is going to be modal top bar. 
And inside here, as I said, we're going to have a button that will say close, and that will call the on request close prop when it's clicked. So we'll say on click, on request close, and that should work out nicely. All right, now the only other thing we have to do now, now that we have the modal top bar, etc., is underneath the modal top bar, we're going to display the children of the modal, and that should display all of the content that we've displayed inside the modal's JSX tags right here inside the modal. All right, so in order for all of this to look good, let's actually go and add these uh, corresponding styles to our index.css. Now, since I've already walked through this in other videos, I'm just going to copy and paste those styles here. All right, I at least have the modal background and modal body. If you want those, you can just pause the video here and type these out. You can also copy them uh, from GitHub if you want to and just paste them into your project. The other thing we're gonna need is the modal top bar class that I created. And this one's gonna be pretty simple. We're just gonna say position relative, and we're gonna say min height. We'll set that to something like 20 picks. Now, the other thing, and I think I actually missed this, we're gonna want to wrap this close button in its own div that will put it over on the top right-hand side. So for this, we're gonna say div. We'll make the class name here something like uh, modal close button. And what we're gonna do for that is go into index.css. We're gonna create that class here and say dot modal close button. And the position for that one is going to be absolute. That's why we set position relative on the top bar. And the top is going to be zero and right is going to be zero. And that will put it in the top right hand corner of our modal. All right, so let's take a look and see what this is gonna look like so far. First of all, though, we have to actually display this modal from inside our notes page. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna have to add a state variable to our notes page component that will keep track of whether or not the modal is currently showing. So what we're gonna have to do first is we're gonna have to import the use state react hook up here. And down here, we're gonna say const show new note modal. Actually, let's uh, change the name of that to something like new note modal is open. Just a little bit more descriptive in my opinion. And then we'll say set new note modal is open. Kind of a long function there, but it'll work. And that's going to be equal to use state and the initial value for that will be false. All right, the modal is going to start off as hidden by default. So now that we have that, we're gonna make this add a new note button, actually set that new state variable to true. So we'll say button on click equals, and we're gonna say inside of here, set new note modal is open to true. And to display the modal now, what we're gonna do is say modal like that. We're gonna import that from its file up here, which was done automatically for me. And for the props, we're gonna say is open. That's going to be new note modal is open. For on request close, what we're gonna do is set this new note modal is open thing to false. So we'll say set new note modal is open false. And what we're gonna do in order to get the children prop in the right place is just put opening and closing tags for this modal component. And inside of here, we'll say something like, I don't know, for now, we'll just say uh, create note. Perfect. So if you wanna see what this looks like so far, let's open it up in our browser. So our app is running already. Let's go back to our app and click on add a new note. And sure enough, what we'll see is our modal component will be displayed here with whatever JSX, whatever elements we put inside that modal's tags displayed here, right? And we also see this close button, which will close the modal. And if we click on the background here, that will close the modal as well. However, notice that if we click on content inside the modal, that will not close the modal because of that e.stop propagation thing that we did a little while ago. All right, if you wanna remove that and see what happens, go ahead and do that. And just one last thing that I noticed while I was looking at it, let's actually add a border radius to our modal body. We're gonna say border radius, and we'll do something like eight picks here. Okay. So now that looks pretty darn nice if I do say so myself. And this is the modal component that we'll be using for 
uh, not just creating a new note, but also doing things like deleting notes and there will be other uses later on, as you'll see. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've got our create note modal component working, the next thing we're gonna do is actually add a form to this that will allow us to create new notes and insert them into the state which is in our notes context. So the way that this is gonna work is we're gonna create a new component which we'll call new note form .js. And this form is gonna contain the input that will allow us to enter a title for a new note as well as a button that we can click to create that note. Now, it might seem strange that we're creating an entirely separate component for something as simple as this, but in general, it's something I recommend. Because if we think ahead a little bit, this new note form that we're creating right now, it's being displayed inside a modal, right? I'm just going to draw it like that and shade in the background like that so we know what we're looking at. Our new note form is currently gonna be displayed inside a modal like this. However, it's perfectly possible that later on in our application development, we might want to display this new note form in other contexts. And by context, I don't mean React context, I mean in other situations, let's say. For example, there might be some kind of page or component that we end up adding to our application where we want to display the new note form directly inside that instead of in a modal. Right, let's say that we want to start displaying our new note form at the bottom of one of our notes lists, right? What that might look like, just user interface wise, we'd have our notes, right? It's got details about the note, blah, blah, blah. Got another note, blah, 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 blah. And maybe we just have the new note form right here, okay? The point is that our application can change and the circumstances surrounding the new note form and where we want to display it can change. So we're doing ourselves a big favor by actually separating the new note form itself from where we want to display it, right? It would be perfectly possible just to call this new note modal and display that from inside our notes page directly, but it's much better long-term to have those as separate components and just put them together when we actually want to display the new note form inside the modal. Okay, so you'll see what I mean in just a second here, but uh, essentially what we're gonna do is inside this new note form, we're gonna say export const, we're gonna create a new component called new note form, of course. And this form is going to take a single prop, which will be called on submit. Now that's just gonna be a function that gets called when the user clicks on the button that's gonna be in this form. And it'll get called with the title that was provided for the new note. All right, now as a default value here, we're just gonna provide a, uh, an empty function so that if the parent component doesn't pass something in for some reason, that won't cause an error down the line. And inside here, we're gonna create a state variable. So let's import use state from React. And that state variable is gonna be called title. We'll create a two-way binding between this and the input inside our new note form. And we'll say set title as well, obviously and we'll say use state, and the initial value of that will be an empty string. Cool, so the actual JSX is gonna look like this. We're just gonna have it inside a React fragment. We're gonna have a title here that says something like add a new note. And then we'll say input. This is gonna be the input for the title. The placeholder here will be something like enter a title, dot, dot, dot. Under that, we'll have value equals title. And under that, we'll have on change, and that's going to keep the title uh, state variable in sync with the value of the input. So we'll say on change e set title e dot target dot value. All right, and that is our input. So we just need to have the button now. The button is going to look like this. It's just going to say on click equals, and this will call the on submit prop up here with the current value of the title state. So we'll say on submit title, and this button will have the text of create. Cool, so that's our new note form, pretty straightforward. Now all we have to do is import this into our notes page and display it inside the modal. So to do that, we're just gonna say import new note form from components new note form. 
And then going down here, we're gonna replace this H1 heading with the new note form. And on submit, we're gonna to have to actually create a function that will be called on our notes context that will create a new note in that state variable uh, with this title that's being provided. So let's just pretend that exists for now. It doesn't, but let's pretend. And for now, we'll call it something like uh, create note. And essentially what we're gonna to want to happen is when this on submit event happens from our new note form, we're gonna want it to call create note with whatever title was typed into that text input inside that component. So to do that, we're just gonna say on submit, this is going to be title and create note, we're gonna say title as well. And that should be all we have to do. Ah, and we're also gonna to want to close the modal when that happens, so let's add some extra brackets to this and we'll say set new note modal is open to false. All right, so the only missing piece in this situation is this create note function. So let's go into our note context provider or notes provider component, we called it, and create just a basic stub function that will do that. We're gonna say const create note. This is going to take a title. And for now, we'll just display an alert that says something like creating a note with title, title. Okay, and we're just gonna pass that create note function through here by saying create note. And that should make it so that our notes page can access it by doing what it's doing here. All right, so what that should look like if we go back to our application now, if we click on add a new note, that will bring up this nice modal with this little form in here. Again, the styling isn't quite on par yet. We'll get to that a little later on, but it should work for now. What we're gonna do now is just enter a title. We'll say, my new note. And if we click on create, we're gonna see that it says creating a new note with title, my new note. Perfect, that's exactly what we want. And after we click okay, it will disappear. Now, the only missing piece to this that we have left is we need to make it so that that new note actually gets added to the notes inside our context. And that's actually a really easy thing to do, so much so that I kind of hesitated when I was typing out this alert because the solution here is actually just one line as well. We're gonna say set notes to notes.concat, and we're just gonna add a new note here with the title of, uh, what do we wanna call it here? Oh, title should just be equal to the title argument that came through. And the content, we're gonna start that off as just an empty string. And for the ID, we're gonna to have to generate a unique ID. And the way we can do that is by using the UUID package, which we've used plenty of times before. We're just going to install that into our project by saying npm install UUID. And we can use that inside our notes provider now by saying import v4 as UUID from UUID. And then we just need to generate a new UUID by saying UUID and calling that as a function. Okay, so that'll create a random unique ID for our new note when we create one. So what we can do now, we should be able to run our application again by saying npm run start. And once we've done that and click add a new note, let's uh, say my new note here. If we click on create, we should see our new note appear right there and if we view it, everything is working just like we wanted it to. So that's how we add the ability to create a new note to our application. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point we have the ability to add new notes. So the next thing that I wanna take a look at is how to actually delete notes. Now, what we wanna do here is add another button essentially to each of these notes in our notes list that will display a modal on the page. All right, so what that's gonna look like is something like this. It's just gonna display a modal here that will ask something like, are you sure you want to delete blah, blah, blah. And it'll say yes or no in the buttons there. And if the user clicks on yes, then we're going to delete that note from the state of our application. Okay, if we say no, it'll just dismiss the modal and nothing will happen. 
So here's how we're gonna do this. We're going to start off, of course, by adding a delete button to our uh, notes list. So let's open up our notes list component. We're gonna add another button next to view that will say delete. So for this, we'll just say button delete. And when this thing is clicked, what we want to happen is we want it to alert the page component that contains this list, right? So our notes page, we want to alert that component that the user has clicked this delete button on a given note so that it can display the appropriate delete note modal. So what we're gonna do for that is we're gonna add a prop here to our notes list, which we'll call on click delete, or you know what, let's call it on delete clicked. Or actually even better, let's keep in the same vein as with our modal and call this on request delete because we're not actually deleting that note yet, right? We're just requesting delete, which means that we want to display the modal or we're allowing ourselves to cancel this operation if necessary. So that's why we're naming it something different here. Okay, and when this delete button is clicked, we're gonna call on request to delete with the ID of the note that that delete button was clicked on. So here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna say on click equals on request delete note.id is gonna be the argument there. So if we open up our notes page again, what we're gonna to have to do is get another function from our notes context, which will be called something like delete note. And we're gonna to have to call that when the user agrees that they want to delete a given note. Now, first of all, just like we did with our new note modal is open state variable here, we're gonna create another state variable for determining whether or not the delete note modal is open. But instead of just having it be true or false, we're actually going to have this state variable be the ID of the note that the user is currently deleting. So we're gonna call this state variable something like currently deleting note ID, not the best name, but it'll work. And then we'll say set currently deleting note ID. There we go equals use state, and the initial value for this is going to be just an empty string, right? Because at first, we're not gonna be deleting any notes. And what we'll do is basically, whenever the user wants to delete a note, we'll set this state variable to the ID of that note, so that we A, know that we wanna display the modal, and B, if the user agrees, we'll know which note we actually want to delete. So here's what that's gonna look like. First of all, we're gonna display a new modal here. We're gonna say modal, is open is going to be equal to whether or not this currently deleting note ID thing exists. So we can just say exclamation point, exclamation point, currently deleting note ID. That's what that does in case you didn't know. And for on request close, we're going to set the current or currently deleting note ID. I misspelled that up here. Currently deleting note ID, set currently deleting note ID to an empty string again. Okay, and inside this modal, we're gonna do something just like what we did with our new note form here. We're gonna create the delete note confirmation form. And for this, we'll just say something like, uh, we'll just go into components, say new file. We'll say confirm deletion, or confirm delete note form.js. And what this is gonna look like, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, we're gonna say export const confirm delete note form equals, and this is gonna take two props. One is gonna be called on confirm, and the other is gonna be called on deny, right? You can call these on yes and on no if you want, if that makes it easier for you, but on confirm, on deny. And basically those are just gonna be functions that get called depending on whether the user clicks on the yes button or the no button. All right, so the basic JSX of this form is gonna be very simple. We're just gonna have a heading that says delete note. Under that, we're gonna have a paragraph tag that says, are you sure you want to delete this note? And under that, we're gonna have a button that will say yes, and a button that will say no. And these are just gonna call their corresponding props up here. So for yes, we'll just say on click equals on confirm. And for no, we'll say on click equals on deny. All right, and we're gonna have to wrap all of this in 
uh, React Fragments, just like with our others. And now back in our notes page, we can import this confirm delete note form. We're going to say import confirm delete note form from its file. And down here inside this modal, we're gonna say confirm delete note form. On confirm, what that's going to do is actually call this delete note thing with the ID that we had inside of here. So we'll say on confirm delete note uh, currently deleting node ID. And we're going to close the modal by saying set currently deleting node ID to an empty string. Okay, and for on deny, we're just gonna say set currently deleting node ID. And here's what that'll look like on deny. Just gonna add an empty function there, paste that inside of there, and that is that. So, so that's our confirm delete note form and that should be everything we need. The last thing we have to do is implement this delete note function now. So let's go into our notes provider. We're going to define a new function called delete note, which will take care of deleting a note by ID. We'll just, uh, we'll have it take a single argument called ID. And what we're gonna do here is say set notes to notes.filter. And what we're gonna do inside of here, we only want the notes whose ID does not match this ID that we want to delete. So note, note.id does not equal ID. And that should take care of deleting our notes. So let's just pass that function through here so that our components can access it. We'll say delete note, and that's all we need now. So let's head back to our browser, and we should see that all of our notes now have this little delete button. So let's try it out. If we click on this delete button, Ah, we still don't have on request to delete. So all we need to do here is open up our notes page and we're gonna have to go down to our notes list and add on request delete as a prop. So on request delete equals, and when that happens, we're gonna set the currently deleting note ID to whatever ID this uh, prop was called with. So we'll say ID set currently deleting note ID to ID. All right. So that should be all we need. Let's check this now. We're gonna click on delete. And sure enough, it says, are you sure you want to delete this note? If we click on no, it'll go away. If we click on yes, it will actually delete that note. So that's how we take care of deleting notes via a modal in our application. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now we can add new notes and delete notes. So the final thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to modify our notes, right? So when we click on edit, in other words, and we can change the title and you know the actual content of the note by changing the values inside the input and text area, how do we actually make those changes be reflected in the context? Well, the basic process for this is gonna be very similar to what we've seen with creating and deleting notes. The main difference here is that there's not actually going to be a modal that we have to deal with, right? It's just going to, you know, when the user clicks on save changes, it's just going to save it automatically. It's not gonna ask for confirmation. So the way that we're gonna do this, let's open up our note detail page. Okay, so we'll open up note detail page. And then down here, when the user is editing, what we're gonna need to do is make this save changes method that this save changes button calls actually save the changes in the context. Now, first of all, let's open up our note provider that's providing all this context. And essentially we're just gonna need to create a new function just like create note and delete note that updates the note. So we're gonna say const update note equals, and this is going to take the ID of the note that we wanna update. And it's also gonna take the updated title and content of that note. Okay, so we're basically going to pass those things as an object, and we're just kind of destructuring them here in our functions arguments. So what that's gonna look like, once we've called it, we're gonna say set notes, and we've seen similar things to this before, for example, in our person tracker application when we wanted to update a given person's information. We're essentially gonna set the notes to notes.map, and we're gonna map each note to itself except for 
the note that we want to modify, right? The note with this ID. So what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say, if the notes ID is equal to ID, we're gonna return the updated title and content of that note. So that'll look like this. We're gonna say ID, title, and content. Otherwise, we're just gonna return the note unchanged by saying note. All right, and that should take care of updating the note. So let's just pass this update note uh, function through the context so that it can be accessed by the components. We're gonna say update note. And now inside our note detail page, we're gonna get access to that through the use context hook by saying update note. And that will allow us to actually update the note with those changes. So all we have to do now is inside this save changes function here. Before we set is editing to false, we're gonna remove this alert and say update note. And we're gonna call that with the ID of the note that's currently being edited, right? So this note ID thing up here that we got from the use params will do. And then we're going to pass the title and the content, but we wanna pass the updated title and content. So the way we can do that is by using these two state variables here. Okay, we can say title, updated title, and content, updated content. And that should take care of updating everything for us. All right, so let's test this thing out now. We're gonna go back to our application and we're gonna try and edit my new note here. We're gonna change this to my old note and we'll type in some text here that says, hello everyone. This is a test to see if updating notes works. And let's click on save changes and what we should see is all of the things that we typed in here should be saved on that note and we should be taken back to uh, the non-editing version of this page. So let's test and see if that's correct. We're gonna click save changes and sure enough, all of the data for our note was persisted. All right, and if we go back to our notes page as well, we'll see that the word count for that note has actually been updated, which is pretty cool. All right, and if we add a new note here, we can say something like, hello, click create. If we go into there by clicking view, we can actually edit that and add some stuff to it. Hello there, right? Blah, blah, and click save changes, and we can see that those changes are persisted as well. And that pretty much completes the basic functionality we're gonna need for our note application. Now granted, we haven't added styling yet. We haven't yet learned how to display markdown in React. There's a lot of other things we still have to do, right? Our notes are still reset if we refresh our page back to you know, whatever this starting point was for them. And that's stuff that we'll take a look at later on. Nevertheless, we covered a lot of great topics here. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Once you've built out the foundation for a basic front end as we have for our note sharing app, it's time to make that app actually look good. And that's what we're gonna do here today. Basically, we're going to take the front end that we wrote for our note sharing app already and add some styling to it. Now, this is going to include things like adding colors, fonts, etc., all the basic layout stuff, but it's also going to include creating a few components that we'll be reusing throughout our application. You'll see what these components look like uh, shortly, and we're also gonna see how to actually render Markdown in React. Uh, you know, taking that basic Markdown syntax and actually translating that into elements that we'll be displaying on our page. So that's our basic plan of attack. After this, our app is going to look really, really good. So this is something you don't wanna miss. Let's jump right in. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna take a look at here is adding styling to our application because right now our application works perfectly fine, right? We can edit notes, we can add notes, we can delete notes, etc. but it looks pretty boring, right? And in, in some places it just looks downright bad, I'm not gonna lie. Like when you're editing notes, 
that's got to change. So what we're going to do first is go through and add some styles to our entire application. Now, as we've seen, there's a lot of different ways you can actually go about adding styles to a React application, anywhere from using something called styled components to, you know, using CSS modules to just using regular CSS inside the index.css file. Now, in order to make this as easy and painless as possible, what we're going to do is just write all of our styles inside the index.css file. To be honest, this is generally how I start off my styling, and as the application gets more complex, that's when I'll actually start moving toward the more specialized things like uh, CSS modules or styled components, where I can kind of have my overarching styles, the ones that apply to a lot of different components inside index.css and have everything else, right? The much more specific things inside the individual uh, CSS files for those components. So just as a side note here, the modal body and modal background, those are probably the kind of things that I would want to put inside some kind of CSS file that's specific to the modal component. Or you could also have that in styled components and just write these as their own styled components inside the modal.js file we have. Okay, and the same thing for modal top bar and modal close button as well. These could probably all go inside a CSS file specific to uh, the modal component itself. And in fact, I'll probably end up doing that. But for now, just to get our app looking as good as possible, as quickly as possible, let's just write all of these styles for our application inside this index.css file. Okay, and then we can kind of split them up afterward if we want to. Personally, the first thing I like to do when adding styling to a React application is change the font. And as we've done in the past, I'm going to use the Google Roboto font. All right, and you can find that right here if you go to fonts.google.com and just search for Roboto. And what we're going to do, we're going to pick the Light 300 version. We're going to click on Select This Style. And I'm not sure if you've seen this before, but basically what this will do is generate a series of links that will take care of importing that font into our uh, application when it's running in the user's browser. And then we're going to use the bold 700. That's just a good, you know, it's a good amount of bold for our application here. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to copy this link that it's generated for us. Notice here that it's included the 300 and 700 weights. We could include extra ones if we knew we were going to need those weights as well. But in general, it's a good idea to only include the weights that you need because this just helps your application to load faster. So I'm going to copy these link tags and we're going to put them inside the index.css file of our application or index.html file rather. And that's going to be inside our public and index.html. And we're just going to add these things up here at the top. Uh, I'm just going to put it right underneath here, right underneath the last meta tag. And that should take care of importing those fonts for us. So now that we've made those fonts available in our application, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set that as the default font for our entire app. Uh, and to do that, we just have to go into index.css. We're going to add that style to our body here. So we're just going to say font family. We're going to set that to Roboto. And we're going to set sans serif as the backup just in case that font fails to load for some reason. All right, and to make sure that our buttons and inputs also have this font family, because by default they won't follow that, which is a little annoying if you take a look at that there. That doesn't look like the uh, same style to me. So what we're going to do is go back here and we're going to just add for now a basic button style which will say font family Roboto sans serif. We can just copy that if we want to. And here, let me adjust the indentation for these so that it matches the rest of the file. And we're gonna do the same thing for inputs and text areas. So we'll say input text area. And for this, we're just going to paste that same thing. Oops, there we go. And that should make it so that the text inside those elements is the same as the rest of our application. So if we go back here now, we'll see that that's updated the font inside the button. And if we click on edit, we'll see that the text inside our input and inside our uh, text area looks the same way as well. All right, so in addition, these buttons still look kind of bad as buttons in unstyled sites tend to look. So let's just add a few more 
styles to our buttons. First of all, we're just gonna make the background color of all the buttons in our application black. If you have a preferred brand color, something like that, you can, uh, you know, you can use that instead, but I'm just gonna do black here. Uh, we're gonna make the border none to get rid of that ugly gray border around the buttons. We're gonna say border radius. We're gonna give them a nice round edge, just like I do with pretty much all elements in my applications. We're going to set the text color here to white so that we get some nice contrast with that black background color. Uh, let's see, we already set the font family, so we can just leave that. We're gonna set a cursor to pointer so that we get that little uh, pointer thing when we hover over one of these buttons, which looks good. And uh, let's see, just a few more things that we wanna do. We wanna set the font size to the same size as the rest of the application, which is 16 picks. We're gonna set the outline to none, and we're going to set the padding to 16 pixels. Now, some of these styles we're gonna want to include in our input and text area styling as well, so we can actually just create a common area for those things, or you can just duplicate them if you want. It doesn't really matter too much at this point. Okay, so for our input and text area, we're gonna want the border radius to be the same, so I'll take that out and put that in here. We're gonna want the font family to also be Roboto Sans Serif. We already put that in there, but I'll just put that in the shared styles up here. We're gonna want the font size to be the same. We're gonna want to have outline none, and we're also gonna want the padding to be the same for those. So we'll put that all up in here. And we're also gonna want box sizing to be border box for all of those so that they fit correctly when we try and do something like width 100%. Okay, so that leaves just a few uh, extra styles inside our button. So let's add some more to our input and text area. Uh, first of all, we're gonna want to set a different border for those. We're gonna say border, two picks, solid. Uh, and then we'll just do a nice light gray border there. And actually that should be all we need to do. I was just looking at my notes here and I think that's the only one that isn't shared between them. So let's go over and take a look and see what that looks like. I'm just gonna close this window here so I stop having to scroll through it. And sure enough, we see that our buttons are looking pretty good. Our inputs are looking pretty good. There's some funny stuff going on with the alignment here, but we'll take care of that in a little while. And everything is looking overall just a little bit better. So another thing that I like to do with my buttons is I like to have the text inside of them bold. So what you can do for that, if you wanna do that, is set the font weight to bold. And that just gives it a little more oomph, if I, if I do say so myself. If you don't like it, don't do it. So anyway, now that we've added those global styles for those things, we are going to obviously have to add a little bit of spacing in between our buttons and stuff here, but we'll worry about that in a little while. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up some extra styles for each of our pages so that this stuff isn't all the way over here to the left-hand side. This is something that we've done previously as well, but doesn't hurt to review, and again, this is something that I generally do at this point. Uh, anyway, so what we're gonna do is we're going to create a style, and we're basically going to wrap all of our pages in it here, as you'll see, that will basically constrain the width of the page to a certain amount and put it in the center of the screen. All right, so what we're gonna do here, the way that we're going to add that to all of our pages without having to go in and add it to each specific page, we're gonna open up our routes component here, and what we're gonna do is surround whatever route is being displayed with a div that has some CSS styling that will constrain its width to a certain amount and take care of centering it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is inside this router component, we're gonna say div, we're gonna give it class name equal to content container, and we're going to basically have all of this stuff, including the switch, be inside of that. And for the styling for that, we're gonna again open up index.css and we're going to add a class here which we'll call content container. Okay, content container. And the styles for this, we're gonna say max width. We'll set that to something like 700 picks. And we'll set margin to auto, which will make it automatically centered horizontally. So there we go. So what that's gonna look like, we should see that our stuff has now moved over. Uh, it 
still looking a little funny because we haven't actually adjusted the width and that kind of stuff to make it take up the full width that's available to it. Uh, that's something we'll do shortly, but for now it's at least not all the way over to the left-hand side of the page. So the next thing that we're gonna do, as I said, is we wanna make it so that certain elements in our application, such as when we edit these things and we have these inputs and text areas and buttons, we wanna make it so that we can have an element displayed across 100% of the available width without having to actually add that width 100% directly to each and every element via style. So the way that we're going to do this, the way that I usually like to do it, and this is inspired by the way that uh, libraries like Material UI usually do it. I'm just gonna create a CSS class called Full Width, and inside there, we're gonna set width to 100%. So now, all we have to do is add this style to elements that we want to be full width, and it will automatically take care of that for us. And while we're at it, I guess, let's add some other classes. Uh, we're gonna add another class which is called Space Below, which will add a margin below whatever element we add it to. Okay, so we'll say margin bottom, and we'll just set that to something like eight picks. And that should be good for now. So let's go and add these full width and space below classes to uh, wherever they're needed. So what we're gonna do, we're going to, we'll start off with full width. Basically, this is going to be applied in several different places in our application. The first one's gonna be in the new note form, all right? So if we go in here, we're gonna click cancel, we're gonna go back, and if we click on add a new note, Notice that this stuff is all kind of scrunched over here on the left-hand side, so what we're gonna do to actually make it look like a real form is we're just gonna make the input and button 100% of the width of their container. And we're also gonna adjust the width of this container here as well because it's a little too wide. Okay, so all we need to do for that is on this input, we're gonna add class name equals full width, and we're also gonna add these space below class that we added before to make sure there's a little space between that and our button. And for our button itself, we're gonna say class name equals full width. We don't have to have space below here because there's nothing below it. All right, so that's going to change the way it looks a little bit. I'm thinking that's looking a little better already. So let's adjust the width of this uh, container here before we move on. And all we're gonna do to do that is just adjust the width of the modal body. So we're just gonna open up index.css again. I should probably stop closing this file because uh, we're gonna need it, but uh, we're just going to adjust modal body and we're going to add, instead of max width 50%, which we did just uh, for the heck of it, we're gonna say max width 400 picks. And that should make it a much more reasonable size there, I think. So that's looking pretty good. So we can create a new note now at our leisure. We'll say something like, Hello there. And if we click create, we'll see that that will appear. All right, so where else do we need the full width styling? We already added it to the new note form. The next thing we're going to add it to is the note detail page. As I mentioned, that's probably one of the ones that's most in need of it. If we view one of these things, actually let's view one with some text here. We're gonna want, when we're editing this, for these things to all be on their own line and not all jumbled like they are right now. So let's open that page up. We're gonna open up our note detail page. And I'm just gonna close the note, the new note form because we don't need that right now. And what we're gonna do is down here to each of the inputs and text areas and buttons, we're gonna say class name equals full width and space below. We're gonna do that same thing for our text area, same thing for our button. I'm just copying and pasting it here. Oh, and be careful with the button. I almost just pasted that inside the uh, on click handler there. And for this button here as well, we'll do the same thing. There we go. And return that, return that. There we go. Okay. Oh, and we don't need space below on this last one. Not that it really matters, but why add extra stuff? Okay, so we're gonna go over here now and everything is looking a little better than it was before at least. We are going to add a nav bar later on too as well so that this thing won't be right up at the top of the screen like it is, so don't worry about that for now. And then the last place we're gonna need to add that full width style, oops, let me try that again. And then the last place we're going to add that full width style is gonna be in the notes page and we're going to add it to the create note button. So that's gonna be down here. 
what we're going to do is say class name equals full width. All right, let me just adjust the indentation here. And that will now look like that, right? So it'll be along the bottom of our page, nice and big so that we can see it if we need to add a new note. And again, we will add some more spacing between here. Just bear with me because we're actually going to rewrite some of the styles for each of these items here to make it look pretty different than it's looking right now. All right, so the next piece that we're going to add styling to is going to be the delete modal, right? The, the way that we're currently displaying the buttons is a little funny looking. What we want to have happen is we want basically these two buttons together to take up the entirety of the width available to them and split it between them so that, you know, it will actually be apparent that it's two separate buttons and not just one button scrunched together. So what that's gonna look like, since this is actually a pretty common thing that we'll wanna do in our application going forward, we're gonna create a more generic style inside our index.css file, similar to what we did with full width and space below, but what we're gonna do is create a class called dot evenly spaced. And this is just gonna have a single style called display flex. And underneath that, we're gonna say evenly spaced and basically everything that's a direct child of evenly spaced, which is what this means here. We're gonna say flex one. And just for purposes of putting uh, some space between them, we'll say margin zero and four picks, which should put some nice spacing horizontally between them. All right, so let's open up our confirm delete note form component now. And what we're gonna do is wrap these two buttons in a div with that class that we just created. So we'll say class name evenly spaced. And we'll put these two buttons inside of that div. All right, so if we go back over now, we should see that those two buttons are displayed quite nicely across the bottom of our delete note modal. And we can actually do the same thing for our items here in our list if we do that with our delete and view buttons. Now we are actually gonna be rewriting those, but what the heck, we created this nice class, so we might as well for now. And what we're gonna do here, we're just gonna say notes list. We're gonna open that up and we're going to wrap both of our delete and view buttons inside a div with that class name, same one as before. We're gonna say evenly spaced. And we'll put those two buttons inside of there like that. Okay, so if we go back now, ooh, it looks like those aren't uh, quite the way we wanted them. We'll need to actually add full width to this view button since it's inside this link, right? What's happening is that the link component itself is quietly taking up this full width and the view button is just happy being its normal width because buttons by default won't take up that full width of their container. So all we need to do for our button here is just say class name equals full width and that should take care of that. So again, there's no space here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but I guess if you wanted to, you could say something like style, just add a inline style here and say something like uh, margin or you know what, let's do padding bottom. And we could do something like eight picks. And that would basically add that space that we're looking for to make it look a little bit better. So that's almost it for the basic styling for our application. We are gonna get into a few more, um, you know, a few trickier pieces of styling shortly, but for now, let's just look through and see if there's anything else. Ah, one thing that I wanted to add to our application actually is if a note doesn't currently have any content, like our new note that we created here, I wanna add a backup message that'll probably be all in italics that will say something like this uh, note currently has no content, something like that, right? So in order to do that, what we're gonna do is we're going to open up our note detail page, which I just closed here. Let me open that up again. And what we're gonna do is up here, or down here rather, where we're displaying our note content, we're first going to test and see if that content even exists. So we'll say note.content, we're gonna use a ternary operator. If that content exists, we'll just display it in a paragraph tag. Otherwise, we're going to display that message I talked about earlier that will say something like, this note currently has no content. Okay, and if we go back here, we'll see 
that right there. But what I want to do is display this in a slightly weaker kind of uh, font, right? We'll make it in italics or something to show that this isn't the actual content of the note, which is kind of what it looks like right now. So let's go back here. We're going to add a special class for this purpose. Uh, so let's open up index.css again, and we're going to add a class called, I don't know, we'll call it something like, we can call it italic, or we can call it weak, something like that. Probably weak is better because uh, if we name it italic and we want to stop displaying it as italic and start displaying it as kind of grayed out or something like that, we would have to actually change the name of that style to make that make sense. So we'll just choose something like weak and inside here, we'll just say font style italic and we'll add that class to this one. We'll say class name equals weak and there we go. It's displaying a little bit more obviously that there's no actual content in the note. All right, and actually now that I think about it, our cancel and save changes buttons would be good candidates for the evenly spaced thing instead of full width. So while we're at it, let's just go and make that change as well. Open up note detail page, which is already here. And we're going to wrap these two buttons inside their own div, which will have the class name of evenly spaced. There we go, evenly spaced. And we're gonna put those buttons in there and we can remove the class names from both of those buttons. All right, so that's what that'll look like instead. I think that looks a little bit better. It's a little more readable, so there you go. And that should be about all of the styling that we're gonna add to our components for now. Again, feel free to spice this up a little bit with uh, more colors and stuff like that. But anyway, at least we're not working with the default HTML styles for now. I, I usually like to get rid of those things at this point because I start wanting to actually have results that look halfway decent. So that's why we did this right now. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've made our app look fairly good, at least in my humble opinion, the next thing that we're gonna do is create a component that I have found to be tremendously useful in almost every application that I build these days, and that is a component that looks like this. So basically, it's just an X inside a circle, and I see it all over pretty much every website that I use these days. Essentially, this is a really useful button that can be used to delete items, right? So we'll be adding it to our list items here in place of this big fat delete button that we have down here, right? Just to allow users to delete items in a little bit of a less intrusive way than having a giant delete button, as I said. And it's also gonna be useful when we add it to our modals, right? Because right now we have this giant close button here, which is a little ugly. So we're going to replace that instead with that same X button that I showed you earlier, okay? Now, creating this thing is a little bit of a fun CSS exercise. It's not super difficult, but at the same time, getting it to look right is a little bit of a challenge. So that's what we're gonna be doing here. We're gonna create a separate component. We'll just call it X button or something like that. I'm sure it has a name, but I don't really care what it is because I think of it as just a little X circle button in my head. <laughs> so, so anyway, let's get creating this thing. We're going to create a new component in our components folder for it. And as I said, we're just gonna call this component something like xbutton.js. And here's what it's gonna look like. It's actually going to be a very simple component, uh, just JSX wise. We're gonna say export const xbutton equals, and it's going to take a single on click prop. And what it'll do after that is we'll just have a div inside of here with the class name of, actually, this would be a good place to use CSS modules or styled components because these styles we're adding here are very specific to our X button. So why don't we just do that right now? We're gonna add a new file here, which we'll call xbutton.module.css. And inside here, we're gonna create two styles, one for the div. You know what, actually, let's just say class name. Let's import these things before they actually exist. We're gonna say import styles from dot slash x button dot module dot css. And for the class name for this one, we'll say styles dot uh, circle or something like that. 
Okay, and the on click will happen when this div itself is clicked. So we'll say on click equals on click. That'll make it so that when the user actually clicks on that surrounding div or the contents of it, it will act as if it was clicked and you know we'll be able to tap into that event in parent components. And then inside this div, we're going to create a span, which will have the class name of uh, styles dot, and we'll call it the X, right? We're not gonna be using this style elsewhere, so we'll just call it whatever we want because that seems to make sense to me. All right, now back in the CSS for this component, here's what the styles that we just created are gonna look like. We're gonna say, we're gonna say dot circle, and here's what that's gonna look like. It's going to have a background color, which is gonna be sort of a light gray, right? That'll be the surrounding circle around the X, remember? And in order to make it circular, we're gonna say border radius 50%. Okay, that'll make sure that it's a circle. And after that, we're gonna say cursor pointer. We want it to have that same kind of uh, effect as the button. We're gonna set the height and width now to a fixed value. So we'll say height and we'll set it to something odd like 25 pix so that we can center the X directly in the middle. The width will be the same, 25 pix. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to say position relative. That will allow us to absolutely position the X inside of it. And finally, we're gonna say text align. We'll set that to center. All right, so that's our circle. Next thing we're gonna say the X as a style. And for this, we're gonna say font weight bold. We're gonna set left to eight picks. We're gonna set the position to absolute. And we're going to set the top to four picks. All right, we'll see if I line that up correctly. Hopefully I did, but if not, we can always adjust it. And last thing for the X is we're gonna want the content to be the little X character. And actually this thing is not a true X, right? A true X isn't quite symmetrical, right? It doesn't have the same height as it does width. So in order to make this look right, I'm going to copy the multiplication symbol. You can just Google that if you want. And essentially we just have to set that as the content and that will make sure that uh, the contents of this span here are gonna be that little X symbol. So let's take a look and see if we got this all right by displaying our X button component inside somewhere. Uh, I suppose that the modal component is as good a place as any. What we're gonna do is replace this close button that we had here, which is just an ugly, uh, you know, it's just kind of an ugly, big black button up in the top right hand corner of our modal. We're gonna replace that with our X button component we just created by saying X button. We're gonna set on click to on request close. And that should be all we need to do there. So let's just uh, change that to single quotes just to be consistent here. And if we go back to our application now, let's see if we actually did this right. We're gonna open up our add a new note and uh-oh, it looks like we ran into some sort of problem. I wonder what that could be. Ah, we need to actually return the JSX from inside our X button. I just forgot to have the return statement. Okay, there we go. Let's try that again. Hopefully it'll go better this time. Let's click on add a new note now. And sure enough, we see that we have this little circle and that it will close the thing, but it's missing the X. And you know what, as a matter of fact, now that I think about it, I was being kind of dumb. Uh, this content thing only works with uh, pseudo elements. So we're going to remove that actually. And we're just gonna put that inside the JSX of our button. So we'll remove that here for span. Just gonna close that tag and we'll put that little multiplication sign inside of there. Okay, so we're just gonna paste that little X there and now it should work like we want it to. Yep, sure enough, we see that little X there. It's not quite centered, so let me make just a little bit of an adjustment here. What we're gonna do, well, let's see. So let's try maybe decreasing the width of this a little bit. We'll say height 24 picks and width 24 picks. See if that makes it a little more centered. That's looking pretty darn close to me, so we'll just leave it the way it is, I suppose. All right, and if we click on this thing, that will actually close the modal for us. So the next place that we're gonna want to add that button, now that we've created it, 
is to our list items inside our notes list. Now, essentially what we're gonna redesign this thing to look like, it's gonna be a fairly straightforward process, is instead of having this big bulky thing with two buttons at the bottom, we're going to streamline it a little bit, right? Do more of the compact uh, kind of design. And we're gonna have the name of the note right here, so something like my first note. And it's gonna say like the number of words right here. And then it'll have the X button here to uh, delete the note if we want to. Now you might wonder, where are we gonna put the view button? Basically what we're gonna do is just have clicking on this list item bring you to the note detail page for that list item instead of having a separate button for it as we did before. So let's do that. What we're gonna do is open up our notes list component. Okay, we'll open that up here. And here's what the styling for this is gonna look like. First of all, we're going to add a class name to our outer div here. Oops, let me try that again, there we go. Okay, so for each of the items, each of the items is going to have a class name of notes list item, okay? And what we're gonna do is also add an on click property to this div which will call a prop that will pass in from the parent component. This will allow us to navigate programmatically when the user clicks on this note container. All right, so we'll call that prop something like on click item. And we'll pass that through to the on click property of this div. Okay, so on click item, and we're gonna want to specify which item was clicked by passing the note ID. All right, so that's our surrounding div here. The next thing we're gonna do is add some styles to each of the elements inside of here. Basically what we have to do, first of all, is we have to set this notes list item class to a flex box. So let's open up index.css. We're just going to add some extra styles here down at the bottom. And you could do this inside a CSS module if you wanted to, but I'm just gonna do it here for now. We'll say notes list item, and we're gonna say flex or display rather, flex, okay? That will display all of the items inside that box next to each other. Oops, on click item is not a function. Ah, what we need to do instead, we need to actually make this an anonymous function. I missed that part. And that should get rid of that error. All right, and then inside the notes list item, uh, we're gonna need to add some styles to the heading, the paragraph tag, and this div here. And in fact, we can actually remove this evenly spaced div because we're going to be uh, removing the buttons that are inside of it. So let's just do that here. We can unindent the button and link things. In fact, we can just remove those all together. We don't need view anymore since that's gonna be taken care of by just clicking on the item itself. And for this button here, we're gonna replace that with our X button component. Okay, so I'm just going to remove that like that. The on click is gonna be the same. It's gonna call on request delete for that note. And we're gonna to need to import our X button component from its file. So from X button. And if we go back and take a look now, we'll see that it's all kind of scrunched over. So we're gonna to have to add a few more styles to our index.css. And uh, what that's gonna look like, first of all, we're gonna say align items center so that everything is displayed uh, you know, centered vertically inside of there, right? We see that it's all lined up nicely now. And we're also gonna say a box sizing border box to make sure that it lines up correctly uh, size wise. We're gonna say border bottom. We're gonna give that a one pix solid light gray border along the bottom. I'll do CCC, I suppose. And you can't see it right now. Let me create another note just so you can see it. That'll just create a nice little divider between our notes so that we can actually tell where one begins and where one ends. All right, so additionally, what else do we wanna add here? We're going to add cursor pointer so that it's clear you can actually uh, you know, have some kind of action occur by clicking on these things, even if one doesn't yet because we're not passing it in from the parent component. So the only other things here, we're gonna add some nice padding here to space things out a little more, and that should be it. So let's uh, just refresh this here. It's a little bit more padded than it was before. Let me just add some things here so you can see that. Everything is looking good so far. Now, another thing that we can do if you want is I'd like to add kind of a hover styling when you hover over these things. 
Maybe that's a little bit old school, but uh, anyway, that's what we're going to do. So what we'll do here is we're just going to say dot notes list item uh, colon hover. And when it's hovered over, we're going to set the background color to a very light gray, which we'll just use EEE -E -E for. And if we hover over these things now, I think it looks all right. So the last thing we need to do is make sure that these things are actually spaced out the way they should be. So let's go back into our notes list. And there's a few ways we can do this. I'm just going to wrap the heading and the paragraph tag inside a div with the style of flex one. And we'll put those inside of there. And here's what that'll look like now. It's looking pretty darn good in my opinion. One last thing though, that's a little bit tricky is if we click on this delete button, we'll see that it will automatically trigger the on click item prop of uh, of our list item. Now, the reason that's happening is the same reason that we had to add the e.stoppropagation function inside our modal. Basically, when we click on this X button, that click event is propagating up to this div, which also has an on click event. So in order to prevent that, we just need to say e, and then we need to say e.stoppropagation inside of this function. We can do that right here by saying e.stoppropagation. And that'll prevent the click event from bubbling up to any outer divs that have a click event of their own. So that should prevent that now. We can just click on this thing here and it'll work just like we want it to. All right, so the last thing we have to do here now is go back to our notes page and actually pass this on click item prop through to our notes list component. Now remember what we wanna do is navigate the user to that notes note detail page. So we're gonna need the um, use history hook from the React Router DOM package. And we're going to get a reference to history here by saying const history equals use history. And then uh, down here where we display the notes list, we're gonna say on click item equals, and we're gonna use the ID to navigate the user to the correct URL. We're gonna say history.push using backticks, oops, there we go, using backticks. Now we're going to say slash notes, slash, and then we're gonna put the notes ID, or just the ID rather, that we're getting from this argument in that URL. So now what should happen is if we click on one of these notes, it'll take us straight through to the notes note detail page. Awesome, and that's the basic rewrite for our uh, notes list items. Everything is looking pretty good now with this little X button here. Feel free to fiddle around with that a little more if you wanna change the way it looks, but I'm thinking it's looking pretty good. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so our app is looking really good at this point. One last thing that we're going to add to it to make it look even better is a nav bar. And this is the exciting part where we'll actually get to come up with, you know, a fictional name for our software and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So let's create our new nav bar. And this nav bar actually isn't really gonna have uh, much functionality at this point because the only page that we really have a name for or a specific route for that is, is our notes page. Okay, so essentially we're just gonna have a title up in the top left-hand corner, right? Whatever we wanna call our app, and that's gonna be about the extent of the nav bar. So here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna create a new component here inside our components folder, and we're gonna call it navbar.js. And inside here, we're just going to define our component by saying export const navbar. Oops, there we go, navbar equals, and we're gonna say return. We're gonna use a nav element here, and inside it we're going to put a link which we're importing from React Router DOM. Again, let me just uh, correct the quotation marks there. We're gonna say link now to, and we're just gonna have this be a link to notes. And inside here we're just gonna have an H1 heading which will contain the name of our app. Now, you can decide for yourself what you want this to be called. I'm just gonna use a fictional name that I came up with. We're gonna call it something like Note Lab with a little bar or like an umlaut or something over the O. Some kind of 
tech startup-y kind of name. All right, now in order to get that bar over the O, I'm just going to copy and paste that. If you want it too, you can just Google O Macron is what that's called. O Macron. And you should be able to find that symbol and just copy it and paste it like that. Okay, so we have our fantastic name for our web application, Note Lab. So what we're going to do now is add a little bit of styling to this. Okay, if we, uh, well, first of all, let's add our nav bar to our application. We're going to open up routes.js. And inside here, right above the content container, we're going to add our nav bar component, which is going to be automatically imported for me. And if we take a look at what it looks like so far, we see that it's just got that annoying default styling for a link. So what we're going to do here is go into index.css and add some styles for it. Okay, so we're just going to add a style for the nav element. And for that, we're going to say padding 16 picks. That'll just give it a little bit more space than it had. There we go. And what else? For the title itself, what we're going to do is inside our nav bar, we're going to give this a class name of some sort. In fact, let's give it to the uh, heading here. We'll say class name. We'll say brand logo. And we'll use that to correct the styling. So we'll say dot brand logo. And what we're going to do is say color black and we'll say text decoration none. That will get rid of the coloring and the underline. Oops, it looks like that didn't quite work. Um, so here, let's go back and add this to the link component, actually. We're going to remove that off of there. We're going to add class name to the link component. Let's see if that made a difference. Okay, yep, sure enough, it got rid of that text decoration thing. And if we click on this now, it'll take us to notes, right? If we go to another page and click on it, we'll see that that takes us directly to notes. So another thing that I want to do just uh, to make this a little more fashionable, I suppose, if if I can even use that word, what we're going to do is highlight part of this title so that not is displayed in a different color. Now you might be thinking, what? Sean's using color in his applications? He always does things in black and gray and white. Well, you know, everybody uh, has to live a little bit, I suppose. So what we're going to do for that, we're going to add a span. And that's going to have the class name of, we'll say something like brand, there we go, brand highlight. And I'm going to use the color red for this, I suppose. All right, we're just going to highlight the note part of it. And we'll say slash span to close off that tag. And now inside index.css, we're just going to say dot brand highlight. And for that, we're going to say color red. Okay, and that looks pretty good if I do say so myself. If you want to use a different color, if you want to use a different name, if you want to use, you know, whatever you want to change about this, feel free to do that. But the point is that we now have a working nav bar for our application. So in the future, if we want to add things like a login button, that kind of thing, we'll be able to up here. Well, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so one last thing that I want to do in this application here is something that we've been putting off a little bit, but it's a fairly central feature of our app, so I think it's important that we do it now. And that is we want to make our app actually render the markdown syntax into something, uh, basically into HTML. And that is that we want our app to actually render the markdown that our users put inside of their notes. Now, in order to do this, there's a very simple solution, and that is using a third-party library called React Markdown. So let's install that into our project here. We're going to say npm install React Markdown and hit enter, and that will install that package for us. So essentially, all we have to do now in our note detail page in order to display this thing is use a component that's exported by that package we just installed which is going to be called React Markdown. Not a super creative name, but it'll work. So what we're going to do in our note detail page is we're going to say import React Markdown from React Markdown. And all we have to do to make this work now, it's actually quite simple. You might be mad at me that I didn't show you this earlier, is we're going to change this paragraph tag that we're displaying our note content in 
into a React Markdown component. And inside those tags, we're just going to display our notes content, okay? And our React Markdown component, what that will do is actually take care of rendering all of the markdown that's inside our content into actual elements. So what you're gonna see here, if we go back here and, oops, we need to start up our app again with npm run start. And what you're gonna see is that it will look completely different now. So let's just wait for it to come up here. And there we go. So our little asterisks on either side have finally turned into actual italic text. So what we can do if we want to is just add a few more things, right? Feel free to look up a markdown reference if, you, uh, if you're interested. If we say, this is a note, that'll display it as sort of an H1 heading in our note. If we use triple back ticks, that will display code in that spot, which is pretty cool. We can say, this is code and close that off. And if we save our changes now, we'll see that those things are actually displayed as their corresponding uh, elements in Markdown. Again, feel free to just look up Markdown syntax if you, uh, if you want a refresher on how Markdown works and some of the basic syntax there. But as I said at the very beginning when we were first building this app, non-technical folks generally tend to like using Markdown instead of having to write HTML and do all of that kind of stuff. So being able to render Markdown in here, especially in a note-taking app like this one, is a big step forward for our app. And it only took us, you know, a minute or two. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Up until now, our note sharing application has been strictly a front end application. And while that can be fun to play around with and show your friends, in order to actually make our note sharing application useful, we're gonna need to add a back end to it. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here today. Uh, more specifically, we're gonna be creating a back end using Express and MongoDB, as well as Node.js, obviously. And we're gonna be creating the basic endpoints for our application, doing things like creating notes, deleting notes, updating notes, and reading notes. So we're gonna see what that all looks like very shortly. Let's jump right in. All right, so what we're gonna do here to start off is we're just going to set up a basic backend for our application using Node.js and Express. Now, the first thing we're gonna have to do here is move all of this code for our front end into its own folder, all right? You could just create a completely separate folder if you wanted and uh, you know start writing your backend code in there. The folders don't have to be close to each other in the file tree by any means but this will just make it easier to manage our project and maybe a little bit easier for you to see how it fits together. So to get started here, let's create a new folder. And inside this folder, we're going to, well, we're just gonna call the folder front end for now. And we'll put all of the files that we have so far, including node modules uh, down to readme inside that front end folder. And just to make sure we haven't missed any hidden files or anything, let's just run LSA inside this folder and we'll see that the only thing we have left behind is the git file which we'll leave since uh, you know I want to be able to commit this as the same repository. And just as a side note here you might want to have separate repos for the front end and back end eventually for a variety of reasons but for now we're just going to keep them all in the same repo so don't worry about it too much right now. The next thing we're going to do is create a new folder for the back end. And the first thing we're gonna do inside of there, just like we've seen before, is we're going to initialize this as an NPM package by, well, first of all, we need to change directories into that backend folder. And then inside of there, we're gonna say NPM init dash Y. And what that'll do is generate this package.json file for us, which will contain basic information about our project, right? The name, the versioning, a description if we need one, uh, what the main file is if we want to import code from this package into other packages. And we also have script. The scripts thing is gonna be the main thing that we're using here. 
So anyway, now that we've generated that package.json file, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up our application and install all of the necessary packages, etc. So here's what that's going to look like. We're going to start off by installing some of the dev dependencies. Now, since we are going to want to write this in the most modern JavaScript possible, and that means we're going to have to transpile it back to a syntax that Node will be able to run and understand. So what we're going to do is install the Babel packages, and that's going to look like this. We're going to say npm install dash dash save dev, and we're going to add Babel slash core at Babel slash node. This Babel node package will allow us to actually run our server in development without having to first build it. And then we're going to install at Babel slash preset dash env. Okay, so let's hit enter, and that will install all of those packages for us. While that's going on, let's uh, create a new file inside our backend and call it dot Babel RC. All right, here we go, new file dot Babel RC. And this is going to contain the settings that Babel will look at when transpiling our code from the most modern JavaScript possible to older JavaScript code. For now, all we're going to need is presets. And we're going to say at Babel slash preset dash env. And that's all we need to do. We can close that file. And assuming that everything has installed now, we should be able to run our code. However, we currently have no code. Now, before we get too far ahead, what I want to do here is create a git ignore file so that we don't end up committing our node modules by accident. I do that every now and then, and it's just kind of annoying to get rid of them. So we're going to add node modules to this git ignore file, and that will make sure that those aren't committed. Okay, so Next, we're going to create a new folder inside our backend called source, and this will contain all of the code for our application. So what we're going to do inside of here is create a new file, which we'll call server.js, and that is going to be where we write our server code. But for now, just to make sure that we have everything set up correctly with Babel, let's just try uh, logging something out to the console. We'll just say console.log. It works. There we go. And we'll include some kind of export syntax just to make sure that uh, the Babel stuff is actually running it. So we'll say export const, and we'll just say x equals 5, or x equals 4, rather. All right, so let's try and run this now. We should be able to run this by saying npx babel dash node, and then the path to our server.js file. So source slash server.js. And we should see that it prints out it works. And just to review here, you may not remember having done this when we uh, created our first full stack React application. In fact, you might not even have watched that video, so uh, I'll show you anyway. If we try and run this server.js file the normal way by just saying node source slash server.js, it'll give us an error saying unexpected token export, right? So in order to use the import and export syntax without uh, fiddling with some settings, which affect some other things in a node project, uh, we can just use Babel to basically convert those into something that Node.js likes to execute. Okay, so everything is working so far. The next thing we're going to do is install uh, some of the more important packages for our server. The most important one that we're going to need to install now is Express. So let's just install that here. And essentially what setting up an express server is going to look like, you may remember this from earlier, we're just going to say import express from express. And we're going to say const app equals express called as a function that'll create a new express server for us. And to make that server listen, we just say app dot listen, and we tell it what port to listen on. So we'll say 8080. And uh, for the callback here, we're just going to say console.log server is listening on port 8080. Okay, and that is our server. We should be able to run it now by saying npx babel dash node source slash server dot js and hit enter. And we should see server is listening on port 8080 logged out to the console.
Now, another piece of setup that I almost always perform when setting up a basic backend application with Node and Express is adding Node Daemon, which as you may recall, if you watch this video, takes care of automatically restarting our server whenever we make changes to it. Because right now, right, uh, we have to do that manually in order to see any changes take effect. So in order to add Node Daemon to our project, we're gonna say npm install dash dash save dev, right? It is a development dependency. We don't want it included in our production bundle when we actually deploy our server. And we're going to install the Node Daemon package, okay? So the way that we're going to use the Node Daemon package is the way that we've used it before. What we're gonna do is add a dev script to our package.json file of our backend that will basically run the rather lengthy node daemon command for us. Um, it's not that bad, but it is a little bit difficult to remember if you're just getting started. So the command that we're gonna want to run here is node daemon dash dash exec. And the command that we're going to be executing with node daemon is babel dash node. And then the path to our server file. Okay, now some of you might be wondering, some of you who saw me set this up earlier might be wondering where the npx went. Okay, so in other words, why isn't this npx no daemon blah blah blah, right? And why isn't this here npx babel node? Well, the reason for that is when we include a command inside a script in our uh, package.json, Node.js will automatically perform the same functionality that npx does. This is a little bit different when we're in the terminal because in the terminal we could be running any kind of command, right? It's not necessarily a command that's local to our project. Whereas when we run one of these, we know that it's local to our project. Okay, so that should take care of running Node daemon for us. And we can see that in fact, if we run npm run dev as a command now, right? That's how we run this new dev script we created. And sure enough, we'll see the node daemon stuff logged out as well as server is listening on port 8080. All right, so another thing that I like to do when setting up a full stack application is to add a script that will automatically run the start scripts for the backend and front end simultaneously. This might seem a little bit lazy to you and perhaps it is, but I find that it just saves me a lot of time in the long run when I don't have to, you know, open up a terminal, go into the backend folder, run the backend command. Oops, I forgot the backend command was dev, not start. Let me try that again, right? And then do the same thing for the front end. Say cd front end, say npm run dev. Oops, I forgot it wasn't npm run dev, npm run start. There we go, right? It just gets a little bit annoying to have to do that each and every time I shut my computer down or close my IDE and open it back up. So in order to do that, all we have to do is create a new package.json file in the containing folder that has both our backend and front end in it. And to do that, we can just open up a new terminal. And if we say npm init y, that will generate that for us. And we're probably gonna to want to change the name of this. Uh, or in fact, we'll wanna change the name inside our package.json of our front end from notes app to something else, right? That can cause some weird conflicts if, uh, if we have two packages of the same name, one inside the other. So we're gonna change this name here to front end and that should be all we need to do there. So what we can do now is inside our notes app, directory, right, which is the containing directory of backend and frontend now, we have a package JSON, so we can actually add a script called start or dev or whatever you wanna call it, which will actually run the scripts automatically for both the frontend and backend subdirectories. All right, well, the first thing that we're gonna have to do here is since both the commands for running the frontend and the backend are uh, a long running process, right, Basically, they'll just continue running. It's not a script that runs and then finishes. We're gonna need to install a package called concurrently. Now there are different ways to do this, but concurrently is just the easiest one I've found. Uh, so let's say npm install dash dash save dev concurrently. And we're installing this, make sure inside the notes app directory, not the front end or back end directory. And if we hit enter now, that will install that package. And then we give it two long running commands that it can run at the same time. All right, now you can have more than two, you can have three or four or five, 
right? If you have, let's say, some microservices or something in your application as well that you want to run at the same time, you can do that as well with concurrently. But for now, what we're going to do in single quotes here, we're going to run npm run start. And to tell npm that we want to run this in the front end folder, right? In other words, we want to use the front end folders start command. All we have to do is say dash dash prefix and we can say front end like that, okay? So that's our first command that we're gonna be running concurrently. The second one is going to be npm run dev, since we named that differently in our backend for reasons that I'll explain later on. And since we wanna run that in our backend folder, we're gonna say dash dash prefix backend, and that will take care of running that in the backend folder, okay? Oops, and it looks like I accidentally edited this so let's just copy this line here. I'm just gonna close this, say don't save, and then I'll just have to paste that line again. That happens when you edit the package.json file while you're installing something because the installation process actually adds something to the package.json file as well. So your changes end up conflicting with what the, uh, with what the npm install command was doing as well. It's kind of an annoying thing. I run into it every now and then, so. That's how you uh, have to fix it, basically. Just copy your changes and delete everything and then go back in and paste them. All right, so let's check and see if this thing works by saying npm run dev. And what we should see, oops, it looks like we're already running that here. We got an e address in use thing here. I'm just going to stop this with control C and we need to kill both our front end and back end. Our back end was running, that's why we got that error. So let's try this again. We're gonna say npm run start, or oops, that was run dev. npm run dev, and hit enter, and what we'll see is we get these little numbers next to the commands that are running, right? This first one is the first command we're running. This second command, or, you know, index one is the second command we're running. So we'll see, you know, our back end starting up and everything and we'll see our front end starting up as well. Okay, so both of those are happening now with a single command, which I find to be very helpful to set up. So anyway, that's what I usually do when I create a new, uh, a new full stack project like this one. So anyway, we can leave that running if we want. We are gonna need to install a few other things, but first, just to make sure that this node modules in our notes app directory doesn't get committed to GitHub, we're gonna add another git ignore here and that git ignore is gonna have node modules inside of it. So we'll say node modules, and that should make sure that thing doesn't get committed. All right, and that's pretty much all of the setup that we have to perform to get our full stack application working. From here on, it's just gonna be coding, 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 and getting everything to actually work together. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we have the basic setup for our full stack application in place, we've got scripts to run everything, we've got everything installed in the back end, and you know, basically we've just got everything set up. The next step, of course, is to actually create different routes on our server that our front end can query. Now, essentially what we're gonna be replacing here is what we saw inside our context in our front end. Let me just open that up here, that was our notes context, which was provided by our notes provider. So basically we're gonna be replacing all of the logic that's in here with calls to our server. Now the reason that we would wanna do this in the first place is really the reason why we would want to build a full stack app in the first place, right? Basically it allows the user to persist all of this data, right? Their notes, everything that they're writing somewhere other than in their own browser on their own computer. Right, so this has a variety of benefits, which I've discussed previously. One is that it allows the user to log into their account, which, you know, we're gonna take a look at logging in later on, but it would allow the user to log into their account on a different computer and see the same data. That's just something we've come to expect these days, of course, but, you know, that's essentially what adding a backend to our application does. It allows us to have a centralized place where all of our users' data is persisted, and then what our front end has to do is just make a query to that back end to do things like load data, create data, update data, delete data, etc. So essentially what we're gonna be doing here is replacing all of these things here, right? All of the 
uh, all of the places where we just have code that's replacing some kind of data in a state variable inside a React component. And we're going to be moving that kind of logic into our server and having our front end just make the right requests to the right server endpoints uh, when these functions here, all right, like create note, update note, delete note are called. Now, additionally, we're going to need to have some kind of logic in here for loading the data. And to do that, we're going to be using the use effect hook. We've seen what this looks like before, but if you don't quite remember what that looked like, this will be a good review for you here. So to get started here, what we're going to do is add our first endpoint to this server. And that's going to be an endpoint for loading all of the notes in our application. So let's create that endpoint. We're going to say app dot get. This is going to be a get endpoint. This is something we talked about previously. Basically, all endpoints that we load initial data from are get endpoints. And the path for this is just going to be slash notes. Okay. Now, just as a side note here, when we end up transitioning our application, right, our note sharing application over to use user authentication, the path for this is going to have to change slightly. It's going to have to actually take into account the user who's making that request. So this might change to something like slash users slash user ID. Oops, user. Okay, I just spelled that completely wrong. Let me try that again. User ID slash notes, right? That might be what this endpoint path ends up looking like. But for now, since our application has only one user, which is us, the developer, we're just going to leave that as notes and we can always, it's, it's a fairly easy thing to change later on. So not a big deal there. Just wanted to point that out. Okay. And essentially what we're going to do inside of here is just return the notes in our server. And eventually we'll be storing those in a database. But for now, just to get the basic front end back end communication built out, what we're going to do is copy and paste the fake notes from our notes provider into our server. And that's basically going to be what we end up modifying and returning that kind of thing. So let's change this to, uh, we'll change it from fake notes. We'll just say let notes DB. We'll just call it DB because it's right now just a fake in-memory database. And what we'll do when the user wants to load those notes is just say response dot JSON and send back our notes DB. In fact, I actually don't like that name. We're going to change this to just notes. We'll use notes DB when we actually add MongoDB to our server. Okay, so we're just sending back the notes to the front end, right? Whoever the client side is, we're sending those notes back. And we should see if we open up our console. Oops, actually, it looks like our server has run into an address and use thing. You know, I've actually found that this happens sometimes when using Node Daemon or just when using some kind of package that restarts your server automatically. I've found that it will sometimes run into this problem when it tries to restart too quickly, right? When you make a change, save, make a change, save in rapid succession, that can sometimes cause problems. So we're just going to restart this here with npm run start or npm run dev. Actually, it was inside our notes app directory, and that should start up our server and our front end and our server should have this updated notes route here. Okay, so what we can do if we want to check this is we can just go to localhost 8080 slash notes in a browser. And what you'll see is that that sends back the data for our notes. Okay. So now that we've created that on our back end, what we're going to do is go to our front end and have our front end actually load that data. So we just need our front end to make the same request that we just made through our browser using a library like Axios or something like that. So um, in fact, I do actually want to use Axios in our front end. So I'm going to open up a terminal in the front end. We're going to say CD front end. And I'm going to say npm install, and we're going to install the Axios package. You can just use something called the fetch API if you want to. I'm not sure if you've seen any videos about that yet. But basically, the fetch API is a built in API in the browser that allows you to make network requests. The reason that I install Axios is because, frankly, it's just much easier to work with. So <laughs> that's the main reasoning there. And now that we have Axios installed, we're going to open up our notes provider. And we want our notes provider to load our notes when the app is first opened up. Okay, so 
what we're gonna do for that, we're going to import the use effect hook from React. And what we're gonna do, first of all, we're gonna delete these fake notes here. And we're gonna set the initial state of our notes state variable here to an empty array. Okay, now if you want to add an is loading variable to this as well, you can do that. We're just gonna say is loading and set is loading. And this will make it possible for components that are relying on this data to actually see whether or not the data they're trying to access is available yet. So we're gonna say use state and that should actually be true since it's loading to begin with by default. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna add that use effect hook that we just imported. We're gonna say use effect. And inside here is where we're going to actually load the notes from our server, okay? Now I put this uh, empty array thing here as a second argument to use effect because we only want this to load once when our application actually starts up, right? When our notes provider is first rendered. There are gonna be situations where that won't be the case where you'll actually want this to load data you know, on different pages that the user goes to, etc. But for now, this is just the easiest way to do it. So inside this use effect hook, we're gonna do what you may have seen before if you watched the full stack introduction videos. And that's gonna be, we're gonna create a new asynchronous function here, which we'll call something like load notes. And that's gonna be async, as I said. And essentially what it's gonna do is use the Axios library to make a request to our server. Now, first of all, two things that we have to do. We're gonna have to import uh, Axios from Axios so that we'll actually be able to use that library to make that request. And the second thing we're gonna have to do is set up a proxy between our front end and back end that will make it so that our front end and back end think they're running on the same origin. This will prevent things like cores errors, that kind of stuff that we saw earlier. So let's open up our front ends package.json here. And all we need to do is add a proxy property and set the value of that to the path to our server, right? Where our server is currently running. Now that's going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8080. And that should be all we need to do. So we will need to restart our front end because this can cause some very strange errors if you don't do it. And I've been burned a couple times by that and you know, spent a long time trying to troubleshoot an error that was just because I didn't restart my front end after doing that. So let's do that right now. In fact, it wasn't even running, so we should be good. I'm just gonna run it again with npm run dev and we should be good to go. So now that we have the proxy set up, what making a request to our backend is gonna look like, we can basically just uh, use the path, right? The path being, let's just take a look here. The path being this slash notes thing or whatever path we've specified for our endpoint. All right, so what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say const response equals await axios.get. We're making a get request here. And then the path is gonna be slash notes. Okay, and that should give us all of the notes back from our server. The next thing we're gonna do is take the data that was included in that response, which should be an array of notes, and set our notes to that response, and set is loading to false. So we're gonna say set notes, response.data, and set is loading to false. All right, now in the case that that fails for some reason, we are gonna want to wrap this in a try catch block just to prevent our app from freaking out if that's the case. And inside the catch block, all we're gonna do, is, for now anyway, is just say set is loading to false. Okay, so basically that will make our the rest of our app work with no notes, right? It'll just pass an empty array and all of our components that our application should work just fine when they have an empty array instead of an actual array of notes. All right, so let's just call load notes now inside our use effect hook. And that should take care of loading the notes for our application. So our app is running. Let's just take a look and see if this actually works. What I'm actually gonna do here is um, I'm going to log out our notes. We're gonna say console.log. And I'm just gonna log out response.data just to show that everything is working correctly inside this use effect hook. Okay, so let's go back to here. I'm going to open up the console here, go to console and refresh the page. And we should see that this array is logged out and that it contains my first note and hello, my dear friends as the content. 
And that's basically data that we're getting back from the server. Okay, now you may have noticed if we refresh this page, we're on the note detail page right now. If we refresh this page, you'll see that the note not found page flashes briefly. And that's because we're not taking into account yet that the notes array could be empty if uh, you know our data is still loading from the server. So what we're gonna do is pass this is loading thing uh, to our value down here. We're gonna say notes and is loading. And that will make it available to components that are using the notes context, and it will allow them to display different things depending on whether or not our notes are loading, right? In other words, for our note detail page, which we'll just open that up here, it will make it so that we can display some kind of loading message if we haven't actually loaded the note yet instead of displaying the note not found page initially, which is a little bit unnerving for users to put it lightly. So what we're gonna do is up here, we're going to get access to the is loading variable, which is now being provided from our notes context provider. And all we're gonna do is check and see if we're currently loading. In that case, we're just gonna display a spinner or something. I'm just gonna display a loading message inside a paragraph tag like that. Okay, so now if we go back and refresh it, we'll just see a nice little loading message flash very briefly before we get data back from the server. Now, one last thing I wanna mention here with our notes provider is that there may well be situations where we don't want to load the note data when the app is first loaded, right? Now, situations like that would be if the user goes to a page that doesn't actually require this data, it's possible that we could be wasting bandwidth by you know, loading notes when it's not clear that the user is actually going to need them. So the main reason that we are doing this right here and loading the notes when the app first starts up is because most of the functionality in our application right now depends on those notes. So in other words, there's no page that the user can go to besides like the not found page that won't need this data. So just to make everything easier, we're loading it when the app first starts up. But again, the point here is that that won't always be the case. So we've added data loading capabilities to our front end, and we've added a corresponding endpoint in our back end to send that data back to our front end. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've got our full stack application set up so that our front end can successfully load data from our back end. So the next thing that we're gonna do is add functionality for creating new notes. Now, the first step in this process is gonna be for us to add a post endpoint to our server. So we're gonna say app.post, and the path for this is gonna be slash notes, right? That's just a RESTful convention is that generally creating resources is done by sending a post request to just the base resource path. Okay, so the callback now is gonna look something like this. We're gonna say request response. And inside here, what we're gonna do is add a new note to this notes array here. And before we do that, we're gonna have to decide what we want this request body to look like. Okay, now before we decide what we want the request body to look like, we are gonna have to add a body parser to our application, right, our express server that is, by saying app.use express.json. This is something that I almost always forget the first time around, uh, and I'm always a little confused why my request body is showing up undefined, and then I remember, oh yeah, I forgot to add that line. So anyway, that line is needed in order for post requests in our application to have uh, a request body inside our callback here. So now that we have that, the next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna say const. And since all that's needed to create a new note in our application currently is the title, what we're gonna do is just include that as a property on the request body. So getting that off of the request body inside this endpoint will look like saying const title equals request dot body. All right, we're using a little bit of object destructuring there to get the title. And once we've done that, we just need to add a new note here to our notes array. And the way we're gonna do that is by saying notes.push. And our new note is gonna look like this. It's gonna have the title that was included in the request body. It's going to have an empty content when it's first created. And for the ID, 
We're gonna have to do what we did on the front end and use the UUID package, which will generate a random unique ID for this new note. So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna have to open up our front end and say npm install UUID. And that should install that package for us. So what we can do now is say, oh, actually, we don't want that on the front end. We already have it on the front end. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, let's go to the back end instead. We're gonna say dot dot slash back end. And here is where we're gonna say npm install UUID and hit enter. Okay, now that should install that package into our back end. So now we can import that up at the top. Oops, let's try that again. There we go. We're gonna say import v4 as UUID from UUID. Okay, and now we can use that to actually generate a new unique ID for each note that's created by saying UUID, and that's our new note. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna to want to do here is we're gonna to want to send back that new note in some form to our front end. Now the simple way to do this, or the easiest way for our front end that is, is to simply send back all of the notes that we've accumulated so far, including the new one that we just pushed onto this notes array. So to do that, all we need to do is say response.json notes, and that should take care of sending back the updated notes to the front end. So the next thing we're gonna do now is inside our notes provider, we're gonna change this create note function so that instead of just saying notes.concat blah, 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 it actually makes a request to that endpoint we just created. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say const response equals await axios.post. Okay, and before I forget, let's add async to this function here. And inside this axios.post, the path here is gonna be slash notes. And the response, remember, is going to contain the updated notes array. So what we need to do here is update the notes state variable to whatever we got back from the server. So for that, we're just gonna say set notes to response.data. And we are gonna want to catch this. So we'll just put a try catch block around it. Now, in reality, you would probably want to display some kind of message to the user if they're request to create a new note wasn't successful instead of just quietly, you know, ignoring that error. But right now we're just going to ignore the error. You can always add some kind of little pop-up at the top of the page, letting them know that an error occurred if you want. Maybe that's something we'll take a look at later on. So we're gonna say catch error. And inside of here, all we're gonna do is just console log that error, whatever happened. Okay, so we're not actually doing any active error handling. We're just, um, we're just gonna kind of ignore that for now. Now, one more thing we need to do is we need to actually send this title argument along with our post request as the request body. So to do that with Axios, we just say axios.post and include this as the second argument. This is going to be the entire request body right here that we can pick up on inside our server's endpoint here. All right, so let's test this thing out. What we're gonna do, let's make sure our front end and back end are both running. You might have to restart this, but I'm just gonna give it a test anyway, because why not? So let's go back to our uh, homepage here. We're gonna click on add a new note. This will bring up the new note modal. And what we're gonna do in here, we'll say, does this work? And now if we click on create, we should see that this new note shows up inside our list here. And if we refresh our page, we'll see that that note is still there, right? This is a first for this application because we never actually persisted our notes in local storage. We just kind of let them disappear when we refresh the application. But now that we're storing this on the back end, these notes will be persisted until our server restarts. All right, and that can be avoided as well by adding a database to our server. So that's our create endpoint. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so moving on in our full stack application, we've added a create endpoint. So the next thing we're gonna do is add an update endpoint, okay? So let's open up our server file and the update endpoint for our notes is gonna look like this. We're gonna say app.put, right? Because update endpoints generally use put requests. 
And the URL here is gonna be slash notes slash and then the ID of the note that we want to update. Okay, so we'll use a URL parameter there and that can basically take any value. Now inside this callback here for our route, what this is gonna look like is we're gonna have to get the updates that the user wants to apply to that note from the request body and apply it to the note with that ID. Now the actual logic for this is gonna look very similar to what we saw inside our notes provider. In fact, we'll probably even just be able to copy and paste this code that we have inside of here with notes.map. But basically what we're gonna have to do is start off by getting the note ID from the URL parameter, which we can do like this. We're gonna say const note ID equals request.params. And we're gonna get the updates from the request body by saying const title and content equals request.body. All right, so now all we have to do is replace the title and content of the note with this ID uh, with the things that we just got out of the request body. So to do that, we're going to, uh, you know what, I'm actually just gonna copy and paste this, uh, this code from here. It should work almost perfectly with one or two minor changes. I'm gonna cut that out of there, paste that in here, and what we should be able to do now is say notes equals notes.map, and we wanna check if the note ID is equal to the note ID URL parameter here, so we'll just change that here, note ID. There we go. If note ID is equal to the note ID URL parameter, then we're going to return a new note with ID equal to note ID and title and content equal to the updates that were in request body. All right. And then when we're done, just like we did inside our create endpoint here, we're gonna send back the updated notes array by saying response.json notes. And now our endpoint should be working enough for us to make this request from the front end. So let's open up our front end and we're gonna replace the logic that's inside update note with a put request to that endpoint we just created. So I guess we'll just start off with a try catch block. We're gonna say try const response equals await axios dot put. We're gonna send that to uh, the endpoint slash notes slash and then insert the ID, which we're getting as an argument inside our update note function. And as the body, we're gonna include the title and content of our note. So let's say title, content, and those will be easily accessible from inside our endpoint. So next up, what we're gonna do, now that we have the updated notes in our response, we're gonna do the same thing as we did inside our create note function by saying set notes, response.data, and then we'll just catch any errors that occur. And again, in reality, you'd probably want to alert the user that something went wrong. But for now, we're just gonna log out that error to the console by saying console.log e. And that should be all we need to do for updating a note. Let's try this one out now by going to our application, which should be already running in the background. I forgot to put the await keyword. Let's add that here. Await, or async keyword rather. Async is what we want. Oh my goodness, there we go. Async, can't type today. Cool, so let's open up a note here and edit it. And you might have noticed that our data actually reset. And the reason for that is of course that our server reset when we made changes to it. So what I'm gonna do is just open up my first note. We're gonna try and add some different things to it. We can add a single line of code here if we want to. Hello world, something like that. And it does that by making an update request to the server. So the last thing we're gonna do now is implement a delete endpoint. And to do that, we're just gonna say app.delete. And we're gonna say slash notes slash note ID, very similar to what we did up here in our update endpoint. Let's just make sure we have the casing there correct. And then we're gonna say request response and essentially we're gonna use the same logic inside of here that we did inside our delete note function inside our notes provider. So I'm gonna cut that out of there and paste that in our server. And I'm gonna delete the set notes thing and change this a little bit to notes equals notes.filter. And then I'm gonna say const note ID equals request.params. 
Okay, so we're getting that note ID. We're gonna have to change this thing here to note ID instead of ID. And that's pretty much all we have to do. We just need to send back the updated notes without that note in it back to the client side by saying response.json notes. Oops, not all in caps, there we go. And now back in our notes provider, let's make the corresponding request to this inside our delete note function. First of all, let's set this to an async function so that I don't forget it. Second of all, we're gonna say try const response equals await axios.put. And we're gonna send that request to notes slash whatever the ID of the note is that the user wants to delete. Okay, and unlike with our update note function, we're not gonna have to include any kind of request body here. We're just gonna have to say set notes to response.data. And then we'll say catch error, and we'll just log that error out if it happens. So console log error. And now we should be able to delete notes from the server from our front end. So let's go back to uh, our front end here. Let's just refresh it to make sure everything's working correctly. It looks like it is. And let's click on this delete button. It's gonna ask us if we're sure we wanna delete this note. Oops, there we go, I did something weird. I don't know what I did. And let's click on yes. And sure enough, that will delete our note for us. So now one thing that you'll still see, however, is this little artifact, so to speak, of our old note. And the reason that that happened I'm actually not 100% sure why, so let's just try restarting our front end and server and see if that happens again. This is usually um, the first step in troubleshooting is to see if it's just a problem with our setup. So we're gonna restart it and try and delete that note again. Let's delete it, click yes. And uh-oh, it looks like there's something there again. So let's go back and take a look at our logic inside our server.js. And that's all looking good. So let's go back to our notes provider here, I suppose, and log out the response we're getting. We'll say console.log response.data just to see what's causing that weirdness that we're seeing there. So I'm gonna open up the inspector window. We're gonna log it out. And let's see what this note even looks like. All right, well, for some reason, we have this ID123 hanging around. Oh, and duh, the reason for that is that I put axios.put, you probably caught that before I did, but that should be axios.delete. That was confusing the heck out of me. So anyway, let's refresh this now, and actually we can delete this note. We're gonna say yes, and we see that we now have no notes in our application. Actually, one thing, now that we're here, and we can actually delete notes, let's change the notes page a little bit so that it displays a message there when there are no notes. This is just a little bit more user-friendly than having an empty page greeting the user. All we're gonna do for that is underneath the My Notes title, we're gonna have a paragraph tag with the class name that we created before of week. And inside there, it will say something like, there are currently no notes. Add one, all right? Very polite suggestion there. and. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just check to see if there are notes. So we'll say notes.length is greater than, or if notes.length is equal to zero rather, then we're going to display this thing. Okay, otherwise we just won't display it at all. So we can see now that there are currently no notes. If we add a new note, that should disappear. And that's a pretty good test of our entire flow here. We're gonna say, uh, this is a note, click on create. We should be able to edit this thing now, add in whatever kind of markdown we want, like that, add some code again, blah, 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 and click on Save Changes. Sure enough, we see those changes are saved, and if we want to delete this note, we can do so again by clicking Delete, and everything seems to be working now. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. At this point, we've seen how to create a basic Node and Express backend for our note sharing application. So the next question we have to ask ourselves is how do we incorporate a database into this application? For this, of course, we're going to be using MongoDB and we've already seen how to add a basic Mongo database to a Node and Express backend, 
But since we're actually working this time on a full-scale application, there's going to be a few things that we have to consider that we didn't have to discuss before. So we're going to be talking about those very shortly. And that's our basic plan of attack. So let's jump right in and add MongoDB to our backend. All right, so to get started adding MongoDB to our backend, the first thing we need to do is actually install the MongoDB driver, right? The NPM package that allows our node server to connect to MongoDB into our backend project. So let's open up our backend folder in the terminal. We're going to need to go to CD backend. And inside of there, we're going to need to install the MongoDB driver by saying NPM install MongoDB. Okay, and if we hit enter now, that will install that package for us, and we should be able to use that nicely inside our server file. So let's open up server.js now, and we're just going to import the main stuff from the MongoDB driver, and after that, we'll need to actually set up a database for ourselves. So first of all, as you may remember, the main thing that we use from the MongoDB driver package is something called Mongo Client. And this will basically allow us to connect to any running MongoDB instance, whether that's locally, whether that's somewhere in the cloud, etc. All right, it's, it's very similar to what happens if you type in Mongo in your terminal and how that opens a shell, except this allows our backend code to interact with MongoDB instead of ourselves interacting with it through a terminal. All right, and I'm just going to close that terminal for now. We will be coming back there in just a moment here. And the next thing we're going to do, we need to, of course, say from MongoDB. And we're going to need to put all of our routes for now inside an async function because connecting to a MongoDB instance with Mongo client is asynchronous. And so we're going to need to use the await keyword, which means we're going to need to create a function. We'll call it something like start. And it's going to be an async function. We're going to put all of our routes inside of there all of the ones that need to use MongoDB, that is, which currently is all of them. And let's just adjust the indentation here. And then up at the top of this start, we're going to connect to MongoDB by saying const client equals await mongo client.connect. And here's where we need to put in the URL of our MongoDB instance. Now, assuming you have MongoDB running locally, you're going to want to say MongoDB colon slash slash localhost and the default port for MongoDB is 27017. Oop, let me try that again. There we go. And then we need to pass a configuration object to Mongo Client Connect that has the properties use new URL parser, true and use unified topology. True. These are just for compatibility reasons, remember? So anyway, that's how we connect to MongoDB. So the next thing we're going to do is set up a database for our application that will actually store our data. We're just going to insert some fake data in there for now uh, so that we can have something to get started with and actually convert our endpoints over to use MongoDB. All right, so first of all, before I forget to do this and wonder why our app isn't starting up, we need to actually call this start function at the bottom of our file here. Ah, and actually, we need to put app.listen inside of there as well. There we go. And now we just need to call start at the bottom of the file, which will make sure that all of our routes are added to the app and that our uh, Express server actually starts up and listens on port 8080. All right, so now that we have that, the next thing we're going to do is set up our database. So open up a terminal. It doesn't have to be in backend, but I'm just going to leave it there because that's where I currently am anyway. And you're going to want to type Mongo. And that will open up the Mongo shell where we should be able to interact with a database. Now, if when you run this command, you see some kind of error like could not connect or something like that, that probably means you don't have MongoDB running in the background. That happens to me every once in a while, so don't feel too bad about it. In that case, you just need to start up MongoDB locally. Uh, just Google that, Google how to start up MongoDB on and then your operating system because it is different for different operating systems. So anyway, once you've managed to connect to MongoDB uh, via the shell, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new database. And to do that, we're just going to say use. And then 
whatever we want to call this database. I'm going to call this notes app DB and we'll hit enter and that will set our shell to interact with this specific database. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to insert our first note into our database and it's going to look an awful lot like this here. So in fact, we're just going to copy and paste that. You can do that right now if you want to. And to insert it into our database, we're going to say DB dot and then the name of the collection we want to insert this into. So I'm going to say dot notes and then we're going to say dot insert one. And in between curly braces here, I'm going to paste all of the properties that I just copied and then we'll close that off and hit enter. And we should see acknowledge true inserted ID blah, blah, blah. And that means that everything went well and that that note has now been inserted into our database. All right, so if you wanna take a look at it now, you can say db.notes.find1 and just pass a empty curly braces there. And that will give us the note that we just inserted, which is currently the only note. And that's the basics of setting up a database for our application. The last thing I'm gonna do here is once we have the client inside our start method, I'm just gonna say const notes db equals client.db and then the name of our database, which was notes app db. Oops, notes app db, there we go. And we're gonna say dot collection and the collection name that we want is notes, okay? So that will basically give us a nice quick way to access our notes without having to say db.collection, db.collection, db.collection throughout all of our endpoints here. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've connected to MongoDB and gotten a direct pathway to our notes collection inside our notes app DB, the next thing we're gonna do is convert over each of these endpoints to actually use MongoDB instead of just, uh, you know, using this fake notes array that we have up here at the top. Now this is gonna be pretty straightforward. All we're gonna need to do is go through each of these routes one by one, swap out whatever they're currently doing with the MongoDB equivalent and from the front end's point of view, everything should look almost identical. All right, so starting off with the get route here, all right, the one for returning all of the notes, the way that this is gonna work, you might remember the MongoDB query for this. It's gonna look a little bit different now that we have this notes DB thing, but other than that, it will be almost exactly the same as you've seen. What we're gonna do, we're gonna get all of the notes from our notes collection. And to do that, we can just say const notes equals await notes db.find and we're going to pass an empty object as the argument here signifying that we want all of the notes and then we're just going to add two array at the end and that is something that's very easy to forget i forget it all the time and wonder why i'm getting back some kind of weird object thing basically this find function doesn't return an array by default so we just have to convert it into that with this thing here all right so that's pretty much it. We now have our notes and can send them right back to the client. So all we have to do is say response.json and send those notes right back. Cool, so that was easy. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is move on to creating a new note. Now for this one, it's gonna look very similar to what we had before. What we're gonna do is instead of saying notes.push here, we're gonna use the MongoDB equivalent, which is insert one. And for that, we just need to say await notes db dot insert one and this is the thing that we want to insert okay so pretty simple not really anything to uh worry about there nothing of note and in order to send back the updated notes which is currently what we're doing uh what we need to do is actually load those again by saying const notes equals await notes db dot find dot to array Okay, and then we're just gonna send those back to the client. Now you might want to make this a little bit more obvious what's going on here by saying update notes or something like that. I'm just gonna change that there so that we know, or updated notes it should be, not update notes. There we go, just so we know what's going on here and why we're loading the notes again. Now one thing to note here, no pun intended, is that 
once our application gets fairly large, we're not going to want to do this kind of thing anymore. In other words, we're going to want to just send back the note that was created, right? Send back this new note that was created with its new Mongo ID and everything. And the reason for that is that the way that we're doing it here, loading all of the notes each and every time that we create a new one, just so that the client can update it on their side, is really kind of unnecessary and it puts unnecessary strain on our back end, right? If we're uh, hosting this app in production and we have a lot of users. So what we'll generally do instead, and we'll come back and change this a little later on probably, what we'll do instead, as I said, is just send back the note that we created, right? We'll have to actually get this back from MongoDB after we create it. And we're gonna just send that back to the client because what the client can do is simply take that new note and add it to the notes that it already has, right? There's not really any reason why we have to uh, send back all of the notes, except for the fact that it's just way easier for the time being, which is why we're doing it in the first place, right? Sometimes it just helps to build something out and you can always go back and refactor it later on. So that's how we create a new note. And just while I'm thinking about this, let's uh, add the async keyword to these callbacks, async, async. And I'm just gonna go through and add them to all of these callbacks for now because I know that if I don't do it now, I'll forget it later. So there we go. All right. Cool. So the next one is going to be our update uh, endpoint here. And for that, it's going to look very similar. We're going to still get the node ID. We're still going to get the title content. The main thing we're going to change here is this uh, update notes thing. And this is one of those instances where MongoDB is actually a little bit less complicated than uh, what we were doing before, as you'll see. So what we're gonna do is update the note by saying await notesdb dot update one. And we're gonna update the note whose ID property is equal to note ID. And then for the updates, we're gonna say dollar sign set. And we're gonna tell it what properties to set by basically just passing the title and the content. And that will take care of updating the note with this ID. Uh, it'll take care of updating those properties on that note to whatever values were in the request body. Okay, so again, to get the updated notes now, what we're gonna do is say uh, const updated notes equals, and this is gonna be the same thing that we've seen before. We're gonna say await notes db dot find dot to array. You're probably gonna get tired of uh, typing this out by the time we're done, but we'll see how to refactor this later on so that we don't have to do this every time. Okay, and then we're gonna send back, of course, our updated notes to the client. And that is our update endpoint. So our last endpoint now is the one that will allow us to delete a note. And here's what that's gonna look like. Instead of using notes.filter, we're gonna use the MongoDB equivalent, which is going to be notesdb. Or here, we're gonna need to say await before that, of course. Await notesdb dot delete one. And we want to delete the note with the ID that was specified in the URL parameters, okay? And then of course, we're gonna get the updated notes again by saying const updated notes equals await array. All right, and then we're just gonna send those updated notes back and that should be all we need to do in here. So unless we've made some kind of syntax error, I probably have, and you've probably already caught it. Unless that's happened, this should work just fine with our front end. So let's close our Mongo shell. And what we're gonna do is run our entire application with the new script that we added recently. And that is, we're gonna go into the notes app directory, right? The surrounding directory for our front and back ends. And we're gonna run npm run start. Oops, I did that last time too, I think. We're gonna say npm run dev, that is. And that will run both our front end and back end simultaneously. And we can open those up in a browser. It should open up automatically. It just opened up in another window here for me. And here's what that looks like. Okay, so everything should work just like it was working before. We should be able to do things like edit our notes, right? I'm just gonna add an H3 here and click Save Changes, and we should see that everything works update-wise. We should also be able to delete our notes if we want to. And if we click Yes, 
there we go, it's gone. And we can also see that it should be gone from the database. So if we open up a new terminal here and go to Mongo, open up the shell. If we say use notes app db and say db.find or db.notes.find that is, we should see that it returns nothing, right? We don't have any notes in there currently. Now, if we add a new note, this should work as well. We should be able to say my first note again. And if we click create, we should see that show up. We should be able to edit that, add, you know, whatever uh, content we want. Blah, 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 perhaps. And click save changes and that should work as well. So it looks like our entire app is working and it's persisting its data now in MongoDB. Now what this means, first of all, is that we can get db.notes.find again, and we'll see that new note that we just inserted with blah, 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 my first note, etc. And it means that if we stop our front end and back end and restart them, that data is still there, right? And that's really one of the main purposes of a database is to make sure that that data is persisted and accessible by the client side. So that's how to convert our back end over to use MongoDB. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've converted our server over to use MongoDB, there's one thing that I wanna show you how to do, and that is split up this server file into multiple files. Now, this is something we haven't seen how to do yet, at least as far as I can remember, and it's a really important thing to do because already our server file is getting a little bit lengthy and a little bit hard to find what we're looking for, right? It's not too bad at this point, but it could be better. So essentially what we want to be able to do here is have each of our routes inside its own file instead of all of the routes inside the server.js file. Now this is a little bit tricky because the way that Express works is we have to call app.get or app.post or app.put or app.delete on the server that we created. And you know, in order to make sure that this all happens when the server actually starts up, there's a little bit of a hurdle to get over with that. Now, obviously, one way to do this would be just to import the app, uh, you know, our Express app into other files and add the routes to them there, right? So if we had another file, we would say something like import app from server.js, right? I'll just blah, blah, blah right there. And then we would say app.get with, you know, whatever our route arguments would be inside of there. Now, this would work, but it's not really my favorite way of doing it for a variety of reasons. The main reason is that when we do it like this, we have to remember to actually import this file into whatever file we're running initially, right? So we would need to have like an index.js file that actually imported all of the files that did this. We would need to have a server file that actually exported this app thing there. And we would need to have files here for all of our routes. And we would need to make sure that the index one imports all of these, and each of these would have to import the server file here. Now that's not really that bad of a thing, but I'm gonna show you a different way to do it that I like doing a lot better for several reasons, which we'll see later. So the way that we're gonna do this is we're going to basically define all of the routes for our application in their own files, of course, as objects. Now that might sound a little confusing, so let me show you what I mean. First of all, let's create a new folder inside our source folder here, and we'll call that folder, oops, we'll call that folder routes. And inside this routes folder, we're gonna create one file for each route that we want on our server. Okay, so we're gonna have one for getting all notes, right, which we'll call list notes route .js. We'll have one for creating notes, which we'll call create note route. Js. We're going to create another one for updating notes, which we'll call update note route.js. And we'll have another one for deleting notes, which will be delete note route.js. Okay, now what each of these is going to look like, as I said, it's going to just be an object. So we can say something like export const list notes route. 
And this object is going to be a sort of configuration object for the route that it represents. Now, because we're designing this ourselves, we can really add in whatever properties we want to this object. But what I'm gonna do just for starters is we're gonna say path as one of the properties. And that will be what we would normally pass to the first argument of express. Okay, so we could say path slash notes for our list notes route. And the second property is going to be a method route, which will just be the method, right? Post, get, put, delete, that we're using for this route. So uh, for listing our notes, that would be get. And the last property that we're gonna define for now is going to be a handler property. And that's just going to be, you know, basically the function that we would have passed as the callback function to our route. So we'll say handler async request response. And that will contain all of the logic that we normally put inside this route inside our server. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy this and I'm going to paste it in there. Now, now one thing to notice here is that this notes DB isn't accessible to us inside here and we can't really import it because it's inside this async function, okay? Now we'll take a look at a few different ways to uh, fix that later on, but first I wanna show you how we would actually add a route like this to our server, right? In other words, once we've expressed all of our routes like this one here as objects, how do we add them to our express server? And, you know, just to show you how this would work, I'm just gonna say response.json for now and we'll just send back something like this. We'll say message, it works, okay? This will just be for testing purposes. But anyway, back in our server, what this is gonna look like is we're going to import our routes by saying import list notes route from its file. And then instead of just calling app.get, app.post, app.blah, blah, blah in each of these, what we're gonna do, I'm just gonna comment this one out for now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say app, and then we're gonna say list notes route dot method, okay? So that will be app.get, app.post, app.put. And then we're gonna call that with the path. Okay, so we can say list notes route dot path and the handler. So we can say list notes route dot handler. Okay, and that will do basically the exact same thing as we saw here, except now we've defined our route inside another file. Now this might seem a little silly to do it this way, and it might seem like there's a lot more uh, typing that we have to do, but what I usually like to do, and this usually makes it much easier to set up and maintain a server in my experience, is from this routes folder, or wherever you have all of your routes defined as objects, we just create an index.js file, which exports all of those routes as an array. Okay, so this might say something like export const routes equals, and that's going to be an array there. And inside of here, we're going to import our list notes route. Oh, let's try that again. There we go. List notes route from list notes route. Just fix those quotation marks there. And we'll add that list notes route to this array. So what that lets you do, now that we have this in an array, is we can actually import all of the routes of our application in one fell swoop by saying import routes from routes. And then we can just loop through them and do this exact kind of thing that we did here with our list notes route, but with all of the routes in our application. So in other words, adding all those routes to our server simply looks like saying routes dot for each. And for each route, all we do is say app route dot method, route dot path, route dot uh, handler. All right, and this single statement that we have here will take care of adding every route that we exported from this index.js file here to our server. So essentially what that allows us to do is define all of our routes inside of here as objects, just like we did with list notes route and export them from index.js. And that allows us to remove them all from our server.js file. So just to show you that this does work, First of all, what I'm gonna do is delete this notes array since we don't need that anymore. We're using MongoDB now. Uh, but just to show you that this works, I'm going to send a request to our uh, list notes route, which we defined, okay? And we should see that we get back this message it works thing. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna restart this and run our app again with npm run dev inside our notes app directory. 
Oops, and it's going to open up the front end, which isn't going to work right now because we're not actually returning uh, the notes as we were before. What I'm going to do, though, is open up a new tab and go to localhost 8080 slash notes, which is the route that we defined as an object just now. And we should see that it says a message. It works. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically rewrite all of our routes to use this kind of format instead of adding them inside our server.js file. Right, this will allow us to split up our server routes quite a bit more than we would be able to do otherwise. But before we do that, we're going to need to take a look at how to allow our routes to get access to this notes DB thing. And that's something that we'll take a look at shortly. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so let's take a look at how to refactor the way that we're connecting and interacting with our Mongo database so that we can actually access it from inside our routes, which are now being defined as objects. So the basic strategy here, it's not really going to be that complicated. What we're going to do is have a special DB file, which will contain a few key methods that will allow us to do things like initialize the database connection and then get access to it from inside our routes just by importing it. So we're just going to create like a DB file. We'll probably just call it something like db.js. And this, as I said, will have a function that will be exported to initialize the database. And it'll also probably just export a DB similar to this notes DB thing so that we can just import that into our routes and use it straight away. All right, so let's take a look at what that's gonna look like. I'm going to create that new file that I just talked about inside source. We're gonna say new file and we'll say db.js. And basically what we're gonna do is move all of the logic that we had inside of here for connecting to MongoDB, right? Everything basically from just this part here. And we're going to paste it in there. And of course, that means we'll have to say import Mongo client from MongoDB. And then, as I said, we're going to export a function that will actually initialize this connection, right? We can't just initialize this connection right inside the file because it's got this await keyword. OK, so we need to have it inside an asynchronous function. So what that's going to be called, we're just going to say export const. And we'll call this initialize db connection, right? Something like that should be good. And that'll just be an async function that takes this thing and connects to it. All right, and in order to make this connection accessible from other files, what we're gonna do is we're going to store this connection, right? Our client here as a variable inside this file. So we'll say something like let client equal and then we'll just set it to something like null at first. And then instead of declaring a new constant inside here, we're just gonna set that client variable to the MongoDB connection. All right, now what this will allow us to do is take this notes DB thing and export that by saying export const notes DB equals client DB, blah, 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 blah. And now what we'll be able to do is inside our route files, we'll just be able to say something like import notes db from db okay and that should make everything work now one thing we do have to remember to do is actually call that initialize db connection function from inside our server but that's typically a lot easier than having to import mongo client and type out all that code so let's just import initialize db connection from db and then at the top of this asynchronous function here we're going to say initialize db connection and of course that's asynchronous so we're going to have to say await before that we're going to want to actually wait for that to start up before we start our server and now we should be able to just move all of our uh, route logic into these sort of route configuration objects right we can uncomment this stuff that we had here and that should all work perfectly well now so let's do the same thing now for our other routes we're gonna i guess we'll just start with our create route why not so we'll go into our create route, what this route configuration object is going to look like. We're going to say export const create note route equals. And this thing is also going to import the notes DB thing, of course, from DB. And the path here is going to be slash notes. 
The method here is going to be post, and the handler here is going to be the handler that we defined inside the server.js file. So we'll say async request response, and we can just copy and paste that code from server. All right, so we're gonna take everything that's inside here, we're going to cut it out, and we're going to paste it inside here. Oops, I pasted it wrong, I suppose. Let's try that again. There we go, we're gonna copy that, paste it in there, and there we have it. Our create note route is now inside an object like this. So we're gonna actually delete this route and the get routes. There we go. And the next one up is going to be the update route. So let's open up our update note route file that we created. And inside here, we're gonna say export const update note route equals the path here, of course, is going to be slash notes slash note ID. The method here is going to be uh, put and the handler here, we're gonna copy and paste that like we did in our other routes. We're gonna say, we're gonna go back to uh, server.js here and we're gonna take everything from inside of there, cut it and put it inside this handler function now. Awesome. And last but not least, let's do our delete route. So that one's gonna look just like the other one. You're probably getting the hang of this by now. We'll say export const delete note route equals. The path here is going to be slash note slash or slash notes slash note ID. The method here is going to be a delete route. And the handler here is going to be async request response. And let's copy and paste that delete logic from our server. We're just gonna take that all from here and put it in delete note routes handler. Okay, and this is also going to require us, I almost forgot to import the uh, notes DB from our DB file. So notes DB from dot dot slash DB. Same thing we're gonna have to do in our update note route. I think I forgot it in here. Yep, sure enough I did. And our create note route already has it. Cool, so that's all of the configuration objects for our different routes. So the last thing we need to do here is export those from our routes index.js file in this array so that they'll automatically get added to our server. So as you can see, after we remove all of that other logic, our server file is actually pretty small, which is a good thing, right? Having all of the logic in its own segregated files like we do in our routes here is definitely preferable to what we were doing before where we had all of the route logic in the same exact file. Um, and it looks like I forgot this UUID thing. We need that for our create note route. So I'll just paste that up there. And then back in our index.js file, we just need to import the rest of our routes here. In fact, let's hope that that'll do it for us. We're gonna say, I'm gonna try and just add this here, create note route. Yep, that was imported for me. Delete note route, same thing. Update note route. And that is all of the routes for our application. So let's try running this thing again. And I may have made some kind of mistake here. We'll just have to wait and see. We're gonna say npm run dev inside our notes app. You can see I almost typed npm run start again. And oops, it looks like we're getting some kind of error for our server here. It's saying client.db, blah, 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 blah. And that's happening inside our db.js file. So let's see what's going on here. Ah, so what we're gonna need to do here actually is we're gonna need to change this to a variable and say export let notes db. And that's going to be equal to null initially as well. And down in here is where we're actually going to set notes db to something. Oops, let me try that again. Notes db equals, and then we can paste that there. So that hopefully should work better. Let me just take a look and see if that's working uh, in the terminal here. Yep, sure enough, it looks like our server's working. So let's go to our front end in the browser here and test this out. So uh, let's. it looks like we currently have no notes. So let's try adding a note here. We'll say, does this work? If we click create now, whoa, it's looking like we suddenly have two notes. Let's take a look at our database and see what the uh, ideal value should be. We're just gonna say db.notes.find. I still have the shell open. And sure enough, we see that there are two notes, so I don't know why we were only seeing one beforehand. Maybe that was just a artifact left over. All right, so it looks like creating a new note works. Uh, let's click on one of these things and see if editing a note works. We're just gonna add in some stuff here. 
We'll say it looks like it. Click Save Changes. And sure enough, that updating uh, apparently works as well. So let's just try deleting a note here. We're going to delete our Does This Work note. Say Yes. And sure enough, it's gone. So everything looks like it's still working and our server is in a much more manageable state at this point. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've been able to split up our server into multiple files, each file with its own route, the next thing I want to take a look at is something I mentioned a little while ago. Because currently, these routes that we've created, if you remember, are sending back all of the notes whenever we make any updates to the notes database. And this is fine right now, but it's really not going to be ideal as time goes on, because as users start to have more and more notes, we could very quickly run into a situation where you know, this uh, puts a lot of strain on our server. So what I'm going to show you how to do is change this around so that instead of sending back all the updated notes each time we make a, some kind of update to the notes database, we're just going to send back whatever the update happened to be. Okay, so basically what we're going to be doing here is having our front end take over some of the logic from the back end. All right, so just going into this, our list notes route, that one's fine. We don't need to make any changes there. But in our create note route, what we're going to want to do is instead of sending back all of the updated notes, we're going to just want to send back the note that we just created. All right, and the way that we're going to have to do that here, remember that when we insert a document into MongoDB through the Mongo shell, we end up seeing something called an inserted ID. And you can't see that here in mine. Let me just insert one here. If we say db.notes.insert1, and we'll just create a note with the ID of 123, we'll have the title of this is a test, and we'll have some empty content there. If we insert that now, notice that it says acknowledge true and inserted ID. Uh, it has this big Mongo DB ID. Now, we're not actually using this ID on the front end. But we will want to include that as data when we send it back because, you know, it's just a piece of data that could potentially come in handy down the road. So the way that we get that here, we have to say const result equals await notesdb.insert1. And then if we want the newly generated ID, what we have to do is just say const mongo ID or something like that equals result dot inserted ID. Okay, and that will give us the ID that was just inserted uh, and automatically generated by MongoDB for the new note that we just inserted. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to send this back to the client with that new Mongo ID. And what that's going to look like is we're going to say response.json. And we're going to take all of the properties that we just created here. So in fact, we should probably move this out into its own variable by saying const new note equals, and then here, let me just, or let me try that again. We'll say const new note equals, and then inside of here, we're going to paste those properties. And then we can say insert one new note instead. Awesome. So now that we have that, the next thing we're going to do is when we send this back to the client, we're going to use all of the data from our new note along with the new MongoDB ID. So we'll just say ID Mongo ID. And remember that this underscore ID thing is the name that MongoDB automatically gives to its ID property, uh, you know, internally. So, so essentially what's happening here is what we're sending back to the client is identical to what that data now is in our database. Okay, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to have our front end actually take this data that it just got back and modify its state so that uh, it has this new note inside of that state. So what that's going to look like, we're going to open up our notes provider that we created. And where we create the note, what we're going to do is in the response, this is no longer the new updated notes array. This is just the note that we created. So all we need to do here is say something like const new note equals response dot data. 
And then we want to set notes not to response.data, but to our current notes state, okay, with that new note inserted. This is sort of similar to what we were doing before we actually converted it over to make network requests, if you recall. So we're just going to say set notes to notes.concat new note. And that will take care of adding that new note to our notes list. All right, so we should be able to see if we go back here and try and create a note. Might have to refresh this here. Yep, there we go. Uh, we see this, this is a test note. I was a little confused about where that came from for a second. Let's try adding a new note here now. We'll say, does it work? And if we click create, we should see that that shows up immediately. Cool, so that's our create note route, and that's how we rewrite it. Basically what we're gonna do for the other routes is rewrite them in a very similar way. So I'm just gonna close some of these here to reduce the clutter. The next one we're gonna do is the update note route. And all we're gonna to want to do here is return the updated data for that note. What we're gonna do is instead of saying updated notes, blah, 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 we're going to change this now to find one and update. Okay, you may remember this uh, function on MongoDB from a while ago. Basically what it does is it updates something and then allows us to return that document. So what that'll look like, we'll say const result equals await notes db dot find one and update. We are gonna have to add another configuration setting to this, which is return document after. That makes sure it returns the updated document and not, uh, you know, and not the document before updating, because if you look at the name of this function, it says find one and update. That makes it sound like find one and then update, which is the default behavior. So by saying return document after, that makes it so that it actually returns the document after the document has been updated. All right, so now we just have to say const updated note equals result dot value, and then we're going to return updated note to the client. All right, so now back in our notes provider here, we're gonna need to change our update note function a little bit. And what we're gonna have to do is, instead of setting our notes to the response.data, which is what we were doing in create note beforehand as well, we're gonna say const updated note equals response.data. And then inside set notes, we're gonna say set notes to, and we're gonna have to do that crazy map thing that we did before. Basically, we're just gonna say notes.map. And for each note, we're going to check to see if that's the note that we wanted to update. So if note ID is equal to ID, then return updated note. Otherwise, return the note itself. Okay, so that's just how we do that. We're just updating this individual note that we wanted to update with that ID and that should work as well. Let's give this a try. We're gonna open up one of these new notes here. We'll say edit, and we'll just type some stuff in here. And if we click Save Changes, we should see that that updates just like we want it to. Now, one thing I just noticed here is it does flash briefly for a second before the value actually updates, and, and the way that we can fix that is inside our note detail page, we just need to make sure we wait for the update note function to happen by saying await. Oh, We're gonna have to convert this to an async function. And that should make sure that it doesn't actually set is editing to false until the update note function has completed. So uh, just to show you what this looks like, it's gonna be a very subtle change. So let's just make a little change here, click save changes. And sure enough, we won't see the old values flash as we did before. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do here is update our delete note route. So let's open that up here. We're gonna say delete note route. And again, instead of returning the updated notes, well, for this one, what we can actually do is just return a status code, right? Our client side doesn't really need to know anything about what just happened besides that it was successful. So to do that, we can just say response.send status and send a 200 status code signifying that everything was okay. All right, and that's pretty much all we need to do. So let's go back now to our notes provider and modify our delete note function here so that instead of getting the response data, we're just going to say set notes to, in fact, we don't even need the response really, since if it's not a 200 status code, it will throw an error and get to here. We're just gonna say set notes to notes.filter note 
note ID is not equal to ID. Okay, and that will delete that note from our state variable in our notes provider. So let's give that a try now. We're gonna go back here. We're going to try deleting a note. And if we say yes, that should work out perfectly. Cool, so we've rewritten our backend in a way that will reduce strain on it. One other thing that I wanted to point out that I don't think I pointed out beforehand, and that benefit is that writing our routes in this way helps to decouple our application logic from the specific Express package that we're using, right? Express is a very useful and also very popular package to write servers with, but there are other options as well. And if you ever wanted to change from Express to another one of those packages, like Happy, for example, that would be very difficult if you wrote all of your routes by saying app.get, app.post, app.blah, blah, blah. But what doing this allows us to do is, you know, we could change all of the code in our server.js file, right, by saying server.js, we could replace Express with some other framework completely, and we could potentially not have to change these routes at all, because all it contains here, well, the only Express-specific thing that it contains right now is just the basic data structure on the request and response objects, right, how those work. If we wanted to, we could actually reduce that dependency even more by getting rid of the request and response here and having our server pass in that data automatically. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that right now. That's more of an architectural level decision, but I just wanted to point out that expressing your routes in a more declarative fashion like we're doing here, declarative meaning uh, we're just specifying different configurations, so to speak, about the route, Instead of actually saying app.get, app.post, that makes our application potentially much more flexible in the future. All right, so I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi, everyone. Sean Wassell here. At this point, we've seen how to build out a front end and a back end, including a database for our note sharing application. But our application has one crucial flaw, and that flaw is that it only supports one user. Now, obviously, all of the applications we want to publish are going to need to support multiple users and allow users to create accounts, log in, etc. And that's what we're going to see how to do here today. More specifically, we're going to see how to add Firebase authentication to our note sharing application in order to allow users to do what I said before, right? Create accounts and log in. So, that's our basic plan of attack. Let's jump right in and add user auth to our note sharing application. All right, so to get started adding authentication to our app, which we're doing with Firebase Auth, the first thing we're gonna do is set up a basic login page and create account page for our front end. Now, we've been through this several times before, so I'm not gonna go into too much depth about what we're doing here, but one thing we are gonna be doing a little bit differently than we might have done before is instead of just creating a login page and uh, create account page directly inside the pages folder and just writing all of the input elements, button elements, etc., inside those pages, we're gonna create a separate component for those two things. And what this is going to allow us to do is once we add some more advanced functionality to our application, users are gonna be able to log into our app, not just through a page, but through things like modals or dropdowns or pop-ups or lots of other elements that basically users will be able to log in through instead of having to go to a completely separate page. Now, for the time being, we are gonna have them log in through a login and create account page, but we're gonna actually create separate login and create account forms in our components folder that will just be displaying on those pages. So here's what all of that's gonna look like. We're gonna start off here by creating a new component called loginform.js, and we'll create another one called createaccountform.js. And I'm gonna go through implementing these two components, but what I'm not gonna go through is actually adding all of the styling. That's something I'm just gonna be copying and pasting from a previous uh, from a previous project, right? Like the one where we saw how to use Firebase Auth for the first time or uh, when we added that to our friend tracker application. So 
If you followed those things, congratulations. You can just copy and paste those. If not, there's a GitHub repo that you should be able to copy and paste the code from. So uh, anyway, let's get started implementing these two components. We're gonna start off with the login form since this will be the simplest. And then I'll just open up the create account form later. So to get started with this, we're gonna need to import a few things. The first thing, since we're gonna be creating a form here is going to be our use state hook which we're gonna import from React, okay? And additionally, we're also going to import the link component from our React Router DOM package. And that should be it for now. We are gonna to have to import something related to Firebase later on, but for now, let's just create this component. Okay, so we're gonna say export const login form here. And this component's actually going to take some props. Now we'll actually add those props when we get there, but basically what these props are going to allow us to do is add somewhat different functionality depending on where we're actually displaying this login form, right? So if we were to display this login form, say inside a modal, right, on a larger page like this with a, you know, the typical modal background here, if we were to display this login form in a modal, we'd want it to behave slightly differently than if we were to just display it on a page, right? If we were to just display it on its own page, then what we'll want to happen when the user actually logs in, if they're successful, is we'll want to actually navigate them to a different page. Now, with a modal, we're gonna wanna do more than that. We're gonna want to, first of all, close the modal, right? And then we're gonna want to probably navigate them to a different page or maybe not, right? That's what these props here are going to allow us to decide later on. So essentially what we're doing here is we're pushing off those decisions into the future once we actually decide where this form is going to be displayed. So I'm just gonna leave those props blank for now, which we're allowed to do in React. And we're going to start off here by setting up the email and password inputs. So of course we're gonna need some separate state variables for both of those. We're gonna need an email and a password state variable. So we'll say email set email equals use state empty string and const password set password equals use state. That's gonna be an empty string as well. You're almost certainly familiar with this by this point. And the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to define the JSX for this component. So this component, in order to allow the parent component to define how it's displayed, right? How wide it is, what kind of container it's inside of, all of our elements here are just gonna be inside of React fragments, okay? That will allow the parent component to define the container for it, as we've seen. And inside here, what we're gonna do is we're going to display an input element. So we'll say input, and the placeholder here is just gonna be a fake email. We'll say John Doe at gmail.com. Under that, we're gonna have value equals our email state variable. And to create a binding in the other direction, we're gonna say on change. And we're gonna set email to e.target.value. That's nothing new there. We've already seen how that works. So the next input that we're gonna define is gonna be our password input. And that's gonna look like this. We're gonna say input. And the placeholder here is going to be your password. And then value is going to be password, of course. And the on change is going to be, there we go, on change equals set password to e.target.value. Okay, and last but not least, we're going to have a button here. And what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say on click equals and here's where we're gonna start adding props to our login form. We're going to add a prop here called on submit login. And basically that's just going to be a function that gets called when the user tries to log in, right? That's where we can actually allow the parent component to define what happens when the user tries to log in, right? Do we navigate to a different page immediately? Do we uh, hide a modal? Do we dismiss a pop-up? Do we change some other element on the page, right? That's what we're going to allow the parent component to do. So for on click, we're just gonna say on, uh, well, this is going to be an anonymous function here. We're gonna say on submit login, and we're going to pass the email and password to this function as arguments. 
and that will even allow the parent component to be the one that decides what tool to use to log the user in. Okay, now if we wanted to, and this is maybe something that we'll look at later, if we wanted to, we could include the logic inside of here for logging a user in via Firebase. And what we could do in that case is we could actually change this prop to something like on logged in successful. And basically what we would do in that case is we would only call this prop if the user successfully logged in. Now what this would allow us to do is actually take care of any errors that occur inside the form itself, as well as avoid duplicating uh, any kind of login logic, right? Like Firebase auth logic. And as I describe it, that's actually sounding pretty good. But for now, what we're gonna do is just go back to what we had before. We're gonna use on submit login, and we're going to allow the parent component to decide for the time being. Again, maybe we'll change that later. Honestly, it's sounding pretty good the more I describe it. So anyway, now that we have this button, this button is just going to say log in. And additionally, there are actually two things that you might have noticed that are missing from this component. The first one is a heading, right? Aren't we supposed to have some kind of heading that says log in up at the top of this form? Well, yes and no, right? This is something that we're also going to leave up to the parent component to decide. So if the parent component wants to have a giant login heading up at the top of the form, all it will have to do is say, you know, H1 and display login inside of those tags, and then it will just be able to display the login form underneath it, right? That's, there's really no reason why we have to include this login heading inside the login form itself. Now the same is true here for this link that we used to have down at the bottom of our login form that would send us to the create account page, right? A little link component basically that would say, uh, don't have an account, blah, blah, blah create one here, right? And basically you would click on this link and that would take you to the create account page. That's how it worked when we actually had specific login and create account pages. In this case, we don't know that that's going to be the exact situation. So just like we're doing up here with the login heading, we're going to allow the parent component to be the one that displays this link if that's what we want, right? That actually wouldn't make any sense at all if we were displaying our login form inside a modal, because if we wanted the user to log in inside a modal, we wouldn't actually wanna navigate when they click on this link. We would wanna use some kind of state variable probably to display the create account form inside that modal instead of the login form, right? So that's why we're not including this thing in this form either. Basically what the parent component is gonna be able to do if that's what they want is say link, two equals blah, 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 and then say whatever text they want here inside those tags. So the parent component's gonna be the one that determines all of this stuff is the point that I'm trying to make. Now I will admit that as I've been talking, I realized that I imported this link thing out of habit, not really thinking ahead to what I just said about this thing. So we're actually going to delete that link because we're not gonna need it. Right? We're gonna use that inside the actual login page or login modal or login pop-up or login. You get the idea. So that's our login form. And that's pretty much all we need to do at this point for that. So let's go and create our create account form, which is gonna use similar concepts to those that we just covered for our login form. All right, so here's what this one's gonna look like. We're gonna start off, of course, by importing use state since obviously we'll be creating a form inside here, as the name would suggest. And then we're gonna say from React. Under that, we're going to, uh, well, I was gonna say we're gonna import link, but I just realized again that that wouldn't be correct either, just like it wasn't correct in the login form. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna say export const create account form. And this one too is going to take some props, which we'll define in just a minute once we get there in the JSX. First of all, though, we're going to define some state variables. The first one here will be their email, all right? So email set email equals use state. Initial value of that's gonna be an empty string. And under that, we're gonna have const password and set password equal to use state empty string. And then we'll have the confirm password. So we'll say confirm password, set confirm password equals use state. 
And that's pretty much all we're gonna have to do right now, right? If we want to allow the user later on to add their name, right, their first name and last name, that's when we would come back and actually add new state variables like first name, last name, etc. But for now, we know that the user is gonna want to log in with their email and password and confirm password, so that's all we're gonna have for the time being. All right, so now that we have those state variables set up, the next thing that we're gonna do is actually define the JSX for our component. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say return, and just like with our login form, we're going to allow the parent component to decide what the container of this form is gonna be by basically displaying all of our elements inside of React uh, fragments. And the first thing here we're gonna have is the input, so this will be for the email, and in fact, we can just copy that from the login form. There's no reason to waste valuable typing time. We're gonna just put that right in here and delete what I was just typing. And after that, we're gonna have the password, which again, we can just copy and paste this. Oh, before we do that, actually, we need to set type equals password so that someone can't just look over the user's shoulder and see what their password is. All right, so after adding that, let's copy and paste this into the create account form. And there we have it. Now, you might be wondering by what I just did, right? Copying and pasting the email and password inputs, you might be wondering if there's a way to, you know, decrease this code reuse, right? To eliminate the code that we're copying and pasting. And that's where the question of code reuse versus, you know, just making components that make sense comes in. Because what I see people do a lot of the time in order to reduce the amount of repeated code Basically, since people have heard so many times the principle, do not repeat yourself, right? That's the dry principle of software development. Since they've heard that so many times, they come to believe that any kind of repeated code is evil. Now, don't get me wrong. In general, I like to avoid repeated code if it makes sense. But in our case here, if we wanted to encapsulate these elements that we just copied and pasted from the login form in their own component, that would be something like, you know, the component would come to be called something like name and password form. And then what we would do is inside our login form and create account form, we would actually use that component, say name and password form. And we would have to have some kind of props to get the name and password values from that. And ultimately would just end up not making any sense. So. This is one of those cases where repeating code isn't necessarily a sign that we're doing something wrong. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Now, one thing you could do, if you really wanted to avoid repeated code while still making things make sense, is you could replace things like the placeholder for our email and password inputs with some kind of text, right? This is where things like localization come in, where if you needed to swap this code out the way we currently have it set up, you would need to actually go back into our create account form and our login form and remove this. And you know, if you wanted to do John Doe at gmail.com in some other language, right? I don't know if there's an equivalent of John Doe in other languages, but, but whatever it is, you could actually have that filled in automatically by some kind of localization uh, engine, right? So I'm not gonna go into that right now, but essentially the idea there is that you would have a package where you could just call like, uh, or internationalization. I've been saying localization. Internationalization is what I'm thinking, where you could just say internationalization library, whatever it's called, right? I'm just gonna call it international. And then you could say dot uh, get placeholder email text or something like that. And that would take care of filling that in for you. Right, so that would be one way to sort of reduce the amount of repeated code so that you wouldn't have to make that same change in multiple places, if that's what you really wanted to do. But since I'm just kind of rambling at this point, let's get back to creating our create account form. And what we're gonna need to do next is add a confirm password input. So let's copy this input here. We're gonna put that down underneath and we're gonna change this now to placeholder. Uh, we'll say re-enter your password. There we go. And for value, we'll say confirm password. And we'll say set confirm password here to make sure that we're setting the correct state variable. And that should be all for our create account forms inputs. So underneath this, we just need to put 
a button, which when it's clicked, we'll call the prop for our create account form, which is gonna be very similar to what we did in our login form. What we're gonna do is say on submit uh, create account, or you know what? Let's just say on submit. In fact, I'm gonna change that on login form as well. We're gonna say on submit, and we'll have on submit for create account form as well, just to avoid long props names where they're not really necessary. We know it's a form, we know it's gonna be submitted, we know basically what uh, properties it's gonna contain, so we'll just call it on submit. All right, and our button here, when it's clicked, is going to call that on submit with the current values of email, password, and confirm password, and we're going to allow the parent component to take care of all of that logic for us. Okay, so we'll say on click, we're gonna say on submit inside an anonymous function here. And the arguments that we'll pass will be email, password, and confirm password. All right, and this is just going to say create account. And that should be all we need for this. Again, what we're doing here is we're avoiding uh, showing the heading up at the top that would say something in you know all caps probably like create account because that's not necessarily what we want. And even in the situation where it is what we want, we can just have the parent component be the one that displays this instead of our create account form. Okay, and likewise, the link down here that would link the user back to the login page is just going to uh, be displayed by the parent component as well, using probably a link component of some kind. So that's the basic plan there. And those are our login forms and create account forms. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've created our login and a create account forms, the next question is, how do we actually hook these forms up into our app to make the user log in like we want? to happen, right? So what we're gonna do essentially is create two parent components for each of these. And obviously those are just gonna be pages for the time being, but as I've been harping on this whole time, those could turn into modals or pop-ups or whatever. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create two more pages in our application. One is going to be the login page.js and the other is going to be the create account page.js. All right, so for the login page, all we're gonna do is import our login form component from its file. So from components slash login form. And under that, we're gonna say export const login page. And this one isn't gonna take any props. All it's gonna do is display the login form with that extra, uh, with those extra elements that we talked about, like the heading and the, uh, the link to the create account page, et cetera. And yeah, that's all it's gonna do basically. So here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna start off by just defining the basic JSX for this component. We're gonna say H1, and inside here, we're going to say log in. Under that, we're gonna display the login form. Okay, and under that, we are going to display a link to our create account page. So let's import the link component up here. I'm gonna say import link from React Router DOM. Oops, there we go, React Router DOM. And we'll put it under here and say link to create, oops, slash create account. Okay, now we still have yet to actually display these pages on those corresponding routes, but this will anyway, set it up for success in the next few minutes. So we're gonna say, don't have an account yet, create one, and this will be the link that takes them to the create account page. Now we're gonna put these elements inside a concrete container with some styling on it, because this is a page and we know what we want it to look like, right? So we don't have to worry about the same things as we did when we were creating the login and create account forms, where we needed to leave it kind of open-ended because we didn't know exactly what kind of container we would want to display those things inside of. Here, we don't really have that problem. So this div, I'm just gonna give this div a class name according to what it's gonna be later on, and that class name is going to be centered container. We'll take care of actually uh, 
copying and pasting this style from our old code later on. But for now, it's just gonna be a centered container, which means that it will display this form in the middle of the page with a constrained width. All right, and that's our login page. So one more thing that we're gonna to want to do here is define a function inside our login page component that will be called when the login form is actually submitted. So uh, we're just gonna call that log in. We'll say const log in. And notice I'm using the capital I here because this is, uh, you know, logging in in the sense of an action. Not that you have to get that technical with it, but whatever. And this function is going to take, if you'll remember, the email of the user and the password of the user, and, and it will end up performing some logic, whatever logic is necessary for logging the user in, right? So that might be um, logging the user in with Firebase Auth, it might be logging the user in with a JSON web token, lots of possibilities there. So for now though, we're just gonna display an alert and we'll come back and actually add Firebase to this project shortly. We're just gonna say logging in dot, dot, dot. And then we're probably gonna want to redirect the user back to the home page, right? That's again, where the way that we've set up our login form makes it very useful. We can decide what we wanna do after the user is successfully logged in. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do here is Basically, we're just going to, we're gonna to need to import the use history hook from React Router DOM as well. So we'll say link and use history. And we're gonna use history to navigate the user programmatically. So we'll say const history equals use history. And then after the user's logged in, uh, you know, once we've displayed this alert for now, we're gonna say history dot push and send them to the home page or the notes page rather, because that is the home page of our application. Okay, so now we just need to pass this login function to our login form. Uh, we're just gonna say on submit log in, and that should take care of it all for us. So uh, what we're gonna do here, we're gonna actually create our create account page first so that we can actually test going back and forth between the two. But once we've done that, we're gonna add routes for both of these pages so that we can actually see them in action. Okay, so our create account page is gonna be eerily similar to our login page, so much so that if we want to, we can just copy and paste a lot of this. Uh, again, the copying and pasting going on here isn't necessarily a bad thing. There may be some way of reducing this code reuse that I'm not thinking of, but uh, you know, if you think of that, feel free to go ahead and use that. All right, so creating an account here, is gonna be pretty straightforward. Instead of using the login form, we're gonna use the create account form. And we're still gonna have link and use history from React Router DOM, since we'll be using those in a very similar way. And just kind of going down line by line here, we're gonna change this to create account page. That's gonna be the name of the component, of course. And then when we say const login, instead of that, we're gonna say const create account and that'll do its thing. It'll say something like creating account. All right, creating account, blah, blah, blah. And it will actually take an extra argument here as well, which will be the confirm password. And then just like with our login page, for now we're gonna send the user directly through to the notes page. Now, just as a side note, and again, this reinforces what we did when we created the login and create account forms. Uh, what we're gonna to want to do eventually is force the user to verify their email address before they're actually able to use the app. So in that case, instead of using history.pushnotes, we're gonna to wanna to do something different and send them to a different page like, uh, you know, please confirm email, something like that. We'll see what that all is going to look like when we get there, but, but I just wanna make you aware that the way we have this component set up right now is going to make that a lot easier to change when we get there. Okay, so for now it's the same, but later on it'll be different. All right, and the centered container, that's gonna be the same. Uh, the heading here is going to be a little different. We're gonna say create account, of course. And instead of the login form, we are of course going to be using the create account form. On submit is going to call the create account function instead of the login function. Okay, so create account which will be called with the appropriate uh, uh, arguments here. And then for the link underneath that, instead of saying create account, don't have an account yet, blah, 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 we're going to say, uh, we're gonna send the user to the login page and we're gonna say 
already have an account. Log in. Okay, so those are our create account page and our login pages. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna do here is actually set up routes for these things so that they'll be displayed at the right time. So let's open up our routes component where we've displayed all our other pages and we're going to start off by importing our login and create account pages. So we'll say import create account page from create account page and a login page we'll do right under that just to keep it in fairly alphabetical order. Uh, we'll say import login page from login page. All right, and now the routes for these things. I generally like to keep the login page and create account pages together route wise. We're gonna have to put them before the not found page, of course. But you know, that just kind of helps me to find them when I go into the routes file later on. Uh, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna say route. The path here is going to be slash login. And inside that route, we're gonna say login page, okay? And likewise for our create account page, we're gonna say route path equals slash create account. And in that case, we're going to say create account page. Oops, there we go. And we gotta close that tag. And that should take care of displaying our login and create account pages for us. So let's start up our application by running npm run uh, dev. And that should run our front end and our back end. And we should be able to view this in a browser now. And that opened in a different window for me. So I'm going to drag it over here. Oops, and it looks like we got an error of some kind. So it says create account form is not exported from blah, blah, blah. Ah, we just forgot to change the file path here. So let's go back to our create account page. We're gonna change login form here to create account form. Perhaps you've even already done that uh, in anticipation of my stupidity. And it looks like we have one more error here. It says on submit login is not defined. Of course it isn't because uh, we need to actually change the name of that. I'm assuming that's in our login form and probably because we copied and pasted in our create account form as well. So this is gonna be on submit email password and for our create account form. Uh, nope, we already did that one. So good, at least I uh, thought ahead for that. And it looks like we have no more errors happening. So let's go back here now and we should be able to go now to our login page, which will look like that. Not the best looking thing. We're gonna add some styles to it shortly and we should be able to see our create account page. In fact, we don't even have to type it in. We can just click on it by clicking this link and that'll take us to create account. Clicking this link will take us to log in and just like that, we can get between our create account and login pages if we need to. Cool, so we've created those pages for our create account form and our login form. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've created pages for logging in and creating an account, the next thing that we're gonna do, well, we're gonna do a few things actually, but the first thing is going to be adding some basic styling to these elements in the page so that they look a little better. Now, I actually lied a little bit, not intentionally, when I said that we were gonna have to uh, copy and paste those styles because we actually already have those styles necessary in our application. So what I'm talking about specifically is we already have a full width style which we'll be able to use to make sure that these things each are displayed on their own line. We already have, I believe it's called space after, something like that, or space below. But that's a class that will allow us to put the appropriate amount of space in between each of our elements on our page. And as you can see, we're already displaying our page inside a width constrained div, right? So that div is making sure that this thing isn't spread out across the entire page. Those are things that I wasn't thinking about when I first said that we were gonna have to copy and paste those styles. So fortunately for us, we are pretty much good to go. Let's just go into our forms and add those styles now. Uh, we're gonna open up our login and create account forms. So login form and create account form. And what we're gonna need to do is add the class names that I just mentioned to each of these inputs. So we'll say class name equals 
full width, and um, I believe it's called space below. Let me just open up index.css and check. Uh, there we go. Yep, space below is the one we're looking for. So let's add that here, full width and space below. And we're going to want to do the same thing for our next input. So let's copy that, paste that. And for our button, we're just going to add those same classes. Let me try that again. Whoa, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted either. Let me try recopying this class name. Apparently, I got something I didn't bargain for. There we go. Okay, so uh, the next thing we're going to do here, I'm just going to adjust the indentation here. The next thing we're going to do here now is we're going to adjust our create account form in the same way. So we're just going to paste that class name for each of these. That's pretty straightforward to do. And for our button as well, we're going to just indent this and put that class name underneath it. And there we go. So now if we go back to our login and create account pages, we see that they look uh, a bit better, right? They're not perfect, but they do look better than they did before. And better rephrase. And better still, we can actually put in something here like sean at gmail.com. Blah, blah, blah is our password. Blah, blah, blah is our confirm password. And if we click create account, it'll say creating account and automatically navigate us to the notes page. All right, and likewise for our login page, let's take a look and see what that looks like. This one's looking pretty good too. Currently, we can just enter in anything we want. It doesn't even have to be an email, really, although just for the sake of testing, I'll do it. Uh, and now if we click on login, it'll say logging in and send us to the notes page as well. So one last thing that I want to add style-wise to these pages, and we can do that by saying uh, login, I'm just gonna go back to that page, is I would like to center this login heading and this link down here. Now what we can do for that, we can either add inline styles or we can just add a universal style for our index.css, similar to what we did with full width, space below, evenly spaced, weak, etc. We're gonna add another style, which we'll just call centered. Actually, let's call this something like H centered, so horizontally centered. And for that, we're just gonna say text align, center, and now we can just go into our forms and add that to, uh, actually our pages. Let's open up our login page and our create account page. And we're gonna add that style to our H1 heading. We're gonna say class name equals uh, H-centered, and same thing for our link. We're gonna indent this here, and we're gonna say class name equals H-centered. Okay, so we'll indent that there, and that should correct our login page. Oops, it looks like that didn't work for the link for some reason. Let me just go back and have a look here. Ah, maybe we also need to say full width for this one to make sure it's taking up the width of its parent. Uh, nope, all right. And actually, in order to get this to work, we're gonna have to add a display block to this link. So I'm just gonna say display block. And that's probably something we could add to our universal H-centered style, but for now, I'll just leave it. So we don't even need full width anymore. That should work with just H-centered. And sure enough, we see that our link component is now centered underneath the button just like we want it to be. Okay, so let's go back to our create account page now and do the same thing. We're gonna open that up. I already have it here. And basically, we're just gonna say class name for our heading. We're gonna set that to H centered. And for our link, we're gonna do the same thing that we did before. We're gonna say class name equals H centered. And Above that, we're gonna add style and set it to display block. All right, cool. So now if we go back here, we should see that all of that stuff is centered and looking pretty darn good. And that should about do it for our login and create account pages. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've got our login and create account pages set up, 
The next thing that we're gonna do is actually set up a Firebase project for our project here that will allow us to actually keep track of users and allow users to log in, create accounts, etc. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to the Firebase console, which you can do by going to console.firebase.google.com. And we see that I've already got a few projects in here created for older videos that I recorded. We're gonna create a new one. And by the way, you might not see this screen. You might just see something that says get started or something like that if this is your first time. Uh, but either way, you're gonna want to get to the point where it allows you to add a project and click on that. And it's going to start off by asking you the project name. Again, this is not something that's permanent. We can uh, basically set this to whatever we want. And this is just how we identify the project inside the Firebase console. But I'm gonna call this note sharing app. And this thing down here can't be changed. So if you see something down there that you don't like, uh, feel free to change that. It does have to be unique across all of Firebase. So if someone else has already taken your unique, uh, your unique string there, you'll have to just come up with something else. All right, so I'm gonna click on continue now. And the next thing it's gonna ask us is if we want Google Analytics enabled for our project. Just to avoid overcomplicating things, I'm going to turn that off. And we're gonna click on create project, which will bring up this little spinner thing. So while our project is being created in Firebase, let's actually install the Firebase package into our front end. We've seen how to do this before, but I'll walk you through it again. We're just gonna say CD front end, and then we need to install it by saying NPM install Firebase. Okay, and that will install Firebase for us here. If we go back to our console now, we should see that our project is ready, so we can click on continue. And that will take us to the sort of home page for the Firebase console. So what we're concerned with now is adding a new app to our project. This is basically where we tell Firebase uh, about our front end and Firebase will give us some unique strings that our front end can use to tell Firebase what it is. We're gonna give the app a nickname. We're just gonna call it React Front End. We're going to leave this also set up Firebase hosting for this app thing unchecked and we're going to click register app. All right, and that's going to spin for a bit, and when it's done, it will spit out a bunch of code that we're gonna to have to copy and paste into our front end. Uh, we're just going to copy and paste this stuff here. You don't have to get all the comments because those aren't really important. Okay, it looks like it's finished installing Firebase into our front end, which is great, so let's open up our index.js file in our front end. And this is where we're going to paste the code that we have. Actually, instead of doing that, I changed my mind. What we're gonna do is we're going to create a new folder which we'll call Firebase. We're going to create a new file in there which we'll call setupfirebase.js. And that's where we're gonna put the code, right? Just to keep it out of the main core of our application. It's, it's generally a good idea to do stuff like that, both for just avoiding vendor lock and just for keeping your code a little bit uh, cleaner and easier to find things, I suppose. So I'm gonna just delete these comments here since we don't need them. And that should be all we need to do to initialize our app is, well, actually what we're gonna to need to do is export a function that will call these things. We're gonna say const initialize app. Actually, we're gonna to need to call this something like setup Firebase. And inside here, we're gonna say Firebase config and initialize app. And we don't need this const app thing since we're not actually using that. All this will do, we're gonna need to call this from inside our index.js file, and that will take care of connecting our front end to our Firebase project in the cloud. So all we have to do now is just import that setup Firebase thing we just created. We're gonna say setup Firebase from dot slash Firebase slash setup Firebase. And then before we call react dom.render, right, before we render all our components into the browser, we're gonna say set up Firebase, and that will take care of all of the setup for us, okay? So now that we've done that, we're gonna need to go back to the Firebase console here, click continue to console, and we're gonna need to set up Firebase auth now. So just click on this authentication thing over here on the left-hand side. That's gonna bring us to a page that looks like this. You can click get started. And all this is gonna want us to do is tell Firebase what ways we want to allow our users to sign up. So for that, we're gonna use email and password. 
We're gonna click enable on this top one here. That's the only one we want for now. And we'll click save. And then we're just gonna to want to add a fake user that we can log in with, okay? So we'll click add user. We're gonna give the email, we'll say john at gmail.com. And password will be abc123, just for ease of typing. Now we can click add user and that will create that user for us, which we should be able to log in with in our front end. Okay, so the other thing that we have to do now in our front end, now that we've actually set up Firebase and everything, we need to make it so that our login and create account pages actually do what their name suggests and log the user in or create an account for the user. Now, as you may remember, this is actually a very easy thing to set up. All we need to do is up here at the top, we're going to import something from the Firebase package. We're gonna say import get off from Firebase slash auth. And then down here when the user wants to log in, Okay, so all we're gonna have to do here is we're gonna have to say await, sign in with email and password, and we're actually gonna have to import that from Firebase Auth as well. Uh, I'm just gonna add that to our imports. We're gonna say sign in with email and password. And we're gonna have to pass get auth called as the first argument, all right? That'll give Firebase the reference to the current Firebase Auth object that it's looking for. And as the second and third arguments, we're gonna pass the email and password that we're bubbling up from the login form. Okay, so that should take care of logging the user in. And after that happens, we're just going to push them to the note page. So uh, let's do the same thing now for our create account page. We're gonna open that up, say create account page. And instead of displaying an alert, which is stupid, we're going to say import get auth and create account. Uh, actually, that's not what it's called. It's called create user with email and password from Firebase slash auth. Oops, not Firebase, Firebase slash auth. And then down in create account here, we're gonna say await, create user with email and password. Okay, we're gonna to need to pass get auth called as the first argument there, and then we need to pass the email and password as the second and third arguments. And you might be noticing that we're not using this confirm password thing yet. Uh, if you really wanna use it right now, we will come back to that when we talk about error handling, but if you wanna use it now, you can just say if password is equal to confirm password, then do what we have here, right? Otherwise, we'll just leave it blank for now, okay? We'll come back and correct that and actually have it display errors and stuff later on. Okay, so both of these things should work, so let's test them out in turn. First of all, we're gonna test out our login page. So uh, here we go, we're gonna go to our login page. Oops, we'll go to localhost 3000 slash login. Actually, let's try running our application first. We're gonna say npm run dev. And in order for that to work, of course, we're gonna to need to go into the notes app directory, not just the front end directory. So let's try that again. We're gonna say npm run dev, and that should run our front end and back end for us. All right, and apparently set up Firebase is not exported from uh, the place that I had it. Um, let's just go to index.js. Nope, that looks right. So let's go into set up Firebase. Ah, sure enough, we need to say export const set up Firebase and that, oops, we need to add async to both our create account and login page here. So that's going to need to be async since it's calling await. And this is going to need to be async as well since that's using await. I'm gonna say async like that. And it looks like that got rid of all of our errors. So let's refresh our page and we should be able to log in with the user we created before. So john at gmail.com and for the password, uh, ABC123 exclamation point. Oh, and by the way, you're not gonna see these things over here. That is my uh, password manager. So you're not gonna see those, it'll just be blank. So if we click on login now, we should see that we're automatically navigated now to the notes page. So let's try out our create account page. We're gonna go to create account. We're gonna try and create a new account. We'll say john2 at gmail.com. For the password, we're gonna enter in the same stuff that we did before, ABC123. We're gonna click on create account, and that should send us to our notes page as well. And if we go back to the Firebase console, 
And under authentication, we should see that a new user has showed up after calling create account. And sure enough, John2 is in there. Well, it looks like our create account and login pages are working correctly. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Now that we've seen how to add Firebase authentication to the front end of our note sharing application, the next thing that we're going to take a look at is how to add it to the back end using Firebase Admin. Now we've already seen the basics of how to use Firebase Admin and how to incorporate user authentication into a MongoDB and Node.js backend, but there's going to be some special cases that we have to take a look at here, mostly concerned with how to tell which users own which notes. So that's what we're going to be talking about here today. And in addition, we're going to be modifying all of our endpoints on our server to take these things into account. So without further ado, let's jump right in and see what this stuff is all about. All right, so to get started adding Firebase Auth to our backend, the first thing that we're going to need to do, and this is something that we've seen before too, by the way, is we're going to need to add credentials to our backend so that it will be able to make admin level changes to our Firebase project. Now, again, admin level changes just refers to the fact that our backend is going to be able to do things like create users, it's going to be able to do things like verify ID tokens. All right, verify tokens. It's going to be able to do things like uh, delete users, etc. right? So there's a lot of things that this thing is going to be able to do that we definitely don't want the code that's running in our front end to be able to do since users can edit that code. All right, never trust the front end. So what we're going to need to do first is inside our Firebase console, which you can find at console.firebase.google.com, uh, we're going to need to go into our project settings and generate a credentials file that we can put into our backend. Now, you may remember that the way we do this is by going to users and permissions and then going into service accounts. And basically what we're doing is we're generating a service account for our backend. Now, a service account just refers to, you know, just like we were able to log in with our email and password up here. A service account allows our backend to sort of log in to our application and make the same level of changes, well, almost the same level of changes as we can inside this, uh, you know, inside our console. Okay, so we're going to click on this generate new private key button, and that's going to download the credentials key for us. So what I'm going to do is in another window, I'm going to open that up, and I'm going to move it into the backend by saying, Reveal and Finder for the back end. Okay, I'm pasting it into there now. And I'm just doing this in a separate window to avoid actually showing this to you. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna change the name of this thing to credentials.json. That'll just make it a little bit easier to work with than a big long random string. So uh, now that we have our credentials.json file, which by the way, you are going to want to add to your git ignore file so that it doesn't actually get committed to a public git repo and compromised. Uh, let's just add that here. We're going to say credentials.json, and you should see that thing get grayed out now. All right, so that means it won't get committed by accident. And now that we have that, we're going to go into our server file, so server.js, and we're going to set up our server to actually use those credentials. So what this is going to look like, and this is something that we've seen earlier, but I'll go over it again just because it's super important in any application where the backend has admin level privileges to Firebase. We're going to start off here by installing the Firebase admin package uh, into the backend, that is. So we need to make sure we do cd backend. And inside here now, we can say npm install Firebase admin. And if we hit enter now, that should install that package. So now up here at the top, we can import Firebase admin by saying import all as admin from Firebase admin. And we're gonna want to import our credentials as well, which we can do by saying import credentials 
from credentials.json. So that's going to be one level up. We'll say dot dot slash credentials.json. And then we initialize admin with those credentials by saying admin dot initialize app. And we say credential and pass those credentials uh, from our JSON file to this by saying admin dot credential dot cert credentials. All right, and that will basically make it so that uh, Firebase admin has admin level privileges to our project whenever we want to use one of its functions inside our server. Okay. And before we go on, I want to underline the importance of not putting this credentials.json file in the front end. And really, I recommend that you don't even put it uh, in the notes app directory outside the back end and front end folders because there's always a chance that the front end could somehow bundle that in when you build it. And that would be a very, very bad thing if someone visiting your site had access to these credentials. They would basically be able to wipe out your entire Firebase project, delete all your users, delete any data you had stored in Firebase, etc. So make sure that this credentials.json thing is kept under lock and key, so to speak, and is safely inside your back end, and that nothing inside the front end is accessing it, okay? So anyway, that's how we set up our server to use Firebase Admin. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've added Firebase Admin to our backend, the next thing that I want to do is set up our backend with the concept of ownership, right? So as we add multiple users to our application, it's going to become important that we know what notes belong to what users, right? We wouldn't want user one over here creating some notes and having user two come along and being able to access those notes, right? Unless, of course, user one has shared those notes with them, and that's something we'll get to later on. So in order to do this, right, we already saw the basics of doing things like this with our friend tracker app, but essentially what we need to do is add some extra properties to our data in the database to signify what notes belong to who. Now, there are several ways to go about this, and choosing the best way isn't a super straightforward task. So to show you what I mean, let me explain two of the main ways that I might go about doing something like this. The first way would be to have each of our notes, right? In addition to having an ID property, uh, a title property, and a content property, we could also add a property that said, uh, you know, owner ID or something like that. And that would contain an ID that would tell it what user was the owner of this note. Okay, so in other words, what user created this note. Now, that's one way of doing it, and that's the way that we used in the friend tracker application. But let's think of some other ways that we could make this work as well. Another way to do this would be instead of having a notes collection in our MongoDB, to instead have a users collection. And inside of there, we could simply have data for each of our users, right? We'd have email, we might have name, we might have, um, I don't know, interests, etc. And additionally, we could also have a property that says notes, okay? And essentially what this would contain, well, there's actually several different things it could contain. One of those things might be just the IDs of the notes that the user has created, okay? So in that case, we might have note one, two, three, four. We might have note two, three, four, five. We might have note A, B, C, D, right? And essentially what we would have to do in that case is whenever the user wanted to load their notes, we would first load that user's information from MongoDB, probably by using the user's ID, of course. Then we would take a look at their notes property and what we would do is we would take each of these IDs and load the corresponding note for that ID from the database, uh, from the notes collection, okay? So that's one way we could do it. The other way we could do it is by actually storing all of the notes themselves directly inside this property, right? So we could say 
uh, you know, instead of having just the IDs, we would actually have the information for each note. So we could say ID, blah, blah, blah. We could say title, blah, blah, blah. We could have content, blah, blah, blah. And we wouldn't even need to have this owner ID thing because we know who it belongs to because it's just on their user object in the database, right? And of course, this could go on for as many notes that they have, and that would work as well. Okay, so already we have several different possibilities for how to store our data in the database. And this is where you can start going down a rabbit hole of should I do this? Should I do that? What's the best way of doing this? What's the best way of doing that? And while most of those questions have fairly certain answers to them, at the point we're at in our application, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time worrying about, you know, will this way work? Will this way work? Because all of the ways will work the only thing we have to be aware of is that it's going to significantly change the logic that we end up writing on our front end and back end, and it could potentially affect our architecture as well. Now, another thing that I want to point out, too, is that in MongoDB, what we generally end up doing uh, when we're faced with several different situations like this is doing a combination of several of these, okay? Now, in order to kind of illuminate what I mean by that, uh, let's take a look at this first situation here where each of our notes just has an owner ID property, and uh, that's basically just the ID of the user that created this note, right? Let's say that in our application, I don't know, a few weeks in the future, maybe a few months in the future, we end up wanting to display the name of the user or maybe the email of the user that owns a note underneath the title of the note. So if a note was something like um, my thoughts, right? Underneath that, we would end up displaying that john at gmail.com created that note. Now, if we had structured our data like this, that would be a little bit of a pain to implement, right? Because essentially, the endpoint that we would be loading this data from would have to first load the notes for the user. And then for each of those notes, that endpoint would have to go through and replace this owner ID property with an actual owner property that would contain things like the email of the owner, et cetera, right? Whatever data we ended up needing on the front end. Now that's of course not the end of the world and it's definitely a possibility, but it does add some extra work on the part of our backend. So in that case, what we might want to do Right? One thing that would make this easier anyway is instead of just storing the owner ID in the back end in the first place, what if we just stored all of the data for the owner on the note instead, right? So this would be just an owner property in the database, and that property would contain an email, it would contain the uh, name, it would contain the interests, basically everything that we would have over here in the users database. All right, and that would make this situation very easy. However, one situation that it would make significantly harder is let's say that a user wants to change their email, right? What used to be a pretty simple thing, we would literally just say something like db.collectionusers.update1 and then update the email property. What used to be a fairly simple thing is now made much more complicated by the fact that this email is duplicated across the database for each of the notes that the user has created and really any other kind of resource that the user has created as well if we continue this method of doing things into other resources, such as if the user is able to create things like blog posts, right, articles, etc. Okay, so that's kind of the trade-off that we eventually run into many times when dealing with databases in our application. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this here to let you know that there's not really a straightforward answer, right? Generally, you'll find that what makes one task easier, right? What might make something like this easier makes something else on the other side of our application, like changing the user's email, a lot harder. Okay, so really it comes down to those trade-offs. Now, just to give you a reverse example of this, let's take a look at the example here that I mentioned of how to store the notes that a user owns, okay? So either of these ways would make the task of displaying all of the notes that a user owns fairly simple. 
right? Let's imagine that on our front end, we want to say, you know, we want to say my notes. And in fact, this is what we do want to do. And then underneath that, we want to display all of the titles for the user's notes. Okay, so uh, my thoughts, my thoughts part two, right? Something like that. Whatever people write notes about these days. If we were to store our notes like this, right? Just having all of the information for that note inside an array on the user's collection, that would make that super simple, right? All we would have to do is when the user first logs onto the app, we load all of their information from this collection here. We can immediately display all of their notes and any other resources that they've created, okay? If we were to instead do this this way that we have here by just storing the IDs of the notes, that would be a little bit more complicated, but we could still work it so that this notes property comes back populated to the user when they log on to our application. All right, now in this case, I'm going to argue that this way of doing things, right, just storing the IDs is better for one very simple reason. And for that very simple reason, I'm going to actually delete all of my drawings here uh, and give myself a little more room. Let's redraw the case that I was talking about. Let's say that we have a user's collection here and that each of those users has a bunch of properties and they also have a notes property which contains, let's say that it contains the actual data of the notes, right? So the ID, the title, the uh, content, etc. Thinking ahead, if we were to use this strategy to store all of the notes on our user's collection, we would run into a very uh, interesting problem, similar to the problem I mentioned before of storing the actual user's data on each of the notes. And that is, at some point in this app, since it is a note sharing app after all, we're gonna want our database to contain a record of what notes have been shared with whom. Okay, so let's say that in addition to having this notes array, which is the notes that um, a user has created, a user also has a property called shared notes. Oops, let me try and spell that correctly there. Shared notes. And what this is, is an array of all of the notes that another user has created and shared with this user, right? So it'll contain very similar information to what we saw up here in the notes that a user created. It'll have the ID of the note, it'll have the title of the note, it'll have the content of the note, etc. And that would make it very easy to display a list that says something like shared with me. Right? And then it would just display all of the titles of the notes that were shared with the user underneath it, just by saying something like shared notes.map and mapping each of those notes to the title, we could say something like, you know, we could display the actual titles of the notes in this section very, very easily without having to populate those notes at all. Now, the problem with that strategy, and again, the reason I'm going through all of this is because I see people do this a lot. Let's say a user makes a change to a note, right? That was fairly simple as we saw when we wanted to create our update endpoint. All we had to do was say, uh, you know, notes db dot update one. And we could just say, you know, we want to update the note with an ID. We want to update the title property and the content property, let's say. Well, if we were to have this extra shared notes property that contained duplicated information uh, in every user that that note had been shared with, this suddenly becomes a lot more complicated, right? Because we need to actually find each of those properties inside each of the users that the note has been shared with and modify, I mean, let's say that the uh, content property has been modified, we would need to modify that in each and every shared notes property of each and every user that that note had been shared with. So anyway, the point of all of this is that it's not necessarily a straightforward process when we're deciding how to store our data in MongoDB. So what we're gonna end up doing really is just kind of picking one of these ways and following that to the end and seeing what kind of problems we run into and if we have to end up changing that in some way. That's generally just how we have to go about uh, developing when we're working with databases like this.
So anyway, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna open up a Mongo shell and we're going to modify our data in our MongoDB uh, a little bit to represent ownership. Now, the way we're going to choose is the way that to me at least at the moment seems the most promising. And that's gonna be to simply add a notes property to each of our users. Okay, which contains the IDs of the notes that, that user has created, All right? Four, five, six, etc. And we're going to have a separate notes collection that will actually contain the notes with those corresponding IDs. All right, so note one, two, three will be this one here. Note four, five, six will be this one here, and so on. You get the point. And that will allow us to quickly and easily update notes, even once those notes are shared with other users, right? So if we add a shared notes property, which also contains those IDs, right? Something like, uh, let's say 789, we'll be able to find that 789 note in our notes collection and use that there. Okay, so that's gonna be our basic strategy. What we're gonna do is open up our Mongo shell. We're gonna to go to the database we created. So we're gonna say use notes app DB. And we should be able to say show collections and just make sure we're in the right database. We should see the notes collection. And what we're gonna do is create a users collection that will basically contain information about the user as well as what notes they own. So. What we're gonna do for that, we're gonna say db.users.insert1, and we're gonna insert an object into our Mongo database, right, a document that is, that matches the user that we just created in here, john at gmail.com, and we're actually gonna delete john2 at gmail.com. We'll just say delete, delete. And in order to link this up, you might remember we just need to copy the user ID that was randomly generated by Firebase Auth. And we're going to add that to our user document inside MongoDB. And we'll use that to actually find that user in the database when that user makes a request. So for this, we're gonna say db.users.insert1. We're gonna add an extra ID here called auth ID. And we're going to paste that ID that we just copied into there. Additionally, we're going to give this user the email that they had. So we'll say email john at gmail.com. And we're going to say notes. And we're going to say that they own one of those notes. Now to find an actual ID of a note that they might own, what you can do is just open up a new shell. So we'll say Mongo here. And what we're going to do is say use notes app DB. And then we'll say db.notes find, and then we'll say dot pretty to make sure they're printed out in a way that we can read it. And let's just copy the ID of one of these notes. Okay, so we'll say my first note belongs to this user. And we're gonna go back to our other terminal and paste that ID. Uh, oops, hang on a minute here. Whoa, something's going wrong. All right, I'm gonna have to retype this. There we go, let's try that again. We're gonna say Mongo, and then we're gonna say use notes app db we're going to say db.users.insert1 we're going to insert a user with the id from firebase auth okay sometimes the terminal gets messed up a little bit so you have to redo this nothing to be frustrated about we're going to say email john at gmail.com and we're going to go back to our other terminal copy this id again and we'll say notes. We're going to paste that first ID into here. Okay, we'll do the second one as well, I suppose. We might as well get that. So we'll copy this note ID here. We're gonna go back here, paste that there. And that will be the user's notes. So we can close off the uh, closing curly brace there and we should be able to hit enter and see acknowledge true, inserted ID, object ID. And now we can find that user if we want to by saying db.users.find.pretty. And we'll see that user's information printed out in a nice readable way. Okay, so we see that our user has an ID property, which refers to their ID in 
the auth provider we're using. We have the user's email. And actually this here is an example of duplicating information because this email is already available from Firebase Auth, but we're storing it in our own database because that makes it easier for us to access. Okay, and lastly, we have the IDs of the notes that this user has created inside this notes array. And that's gonna be the basic structure for all of the user objects we create. So I hope that this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've decided on a basic structure for the data in our database and how we're going to express ownership over the notes in our database, the next thing we need to do is actually rewrite some of the endpoints in our backend to take that into account. Now to show you what I mean by this, the first thing we're gonna do is open up our list notes route and make a few changes here. Okay, so the first change we're gonna make here is instead of having the path just be slash notes, we're gonna to have to change it a little bit to express the fact that we don't want all of the notes from the database. All we want is all of the notes for a specific user. Now, to keep this in line with the basic conventions of REST APIs, what I'm gonna suggest we do is change the path from slash notes to slash users slash user ID, which we're gonna use as a URL parameter here, and then we'll say slash notes. So essentially, Again, in RESTful convention, what this says is we want all of the notes for the user with this ID here. And that'll look something like this. We'll say users slash 123 slash notes, and that will give us all of the notes that user 123 has created. All right, so that's our basic plan with the path here. So the next thing we're going to need to do is take that into account in the actual handler for this route. So the change we're gonna to need to make here, the first thing we're gonna to need to do is get the value of this user ID URL parameter out of the path, right? And the way that we do that, we've seen this in other routes before, we're gonna say const user ID equals request.params, and that will give us the uh, URL parameter values for the current request that we're processing. Okay, so now that we have the ID of the user that we wanna load the notes for, the next thing we need to do is change the way that we're interacting with this database, okay? Now, we have this notes DB thing, which basically is just a reference to our notes collection in MongoDB. However, remember that when we inserted the user and the information about the notes that they owned, we inserted that into a different collection, which was the users collection. So let's just open that up again here. We're gonna say use notes app DB and we'll say db.users.find.pretty. We see that the IDs of the notes that this user uh, with whatever ID it is that we have here from the URL parameters owns are inside the user's collection. So what we're gonna need to do here is add something to the db file of our backend. And instead of just giving access to the notes db, we're gonna also have to give access to the users db. So what we can do in order to make that happen is say export let users db equals null. And then just like we did for our notes db, we're gonna say users db equals client.db notes app db, and we'll say dot collection users. Okay, and that will give us the same reference to the users collection in MongoDB as we had with our notes collection earlier. One other thing that we can do here too, by the way, is actually reduce a little bit of the repeated code by just saying const db equals client dot db notes app db. That way, if we were to change the db name, we would just have to change it one spot. And then we can just say db dot collection notes and db dot collection users, and it's just a little bit easier. It's not a big deal since we're gonna make very few changes generally to this file here, but you know, it helps out a little bit. So now that we've exported this users DB thing, we're gonna have to change our list notes route to use that instead of the notes DB. Well, in fact, we're gonna have to use both because we're gonna have to get 
each of the notes with the corresponding IDs that we have from our user once we load it. And I'll show you what I mean here in a moment by that, but we're gonna say users DB. And the first thing that we're gonna do is load the user by their user ID. And to do that, we'll say const user equals await users db dot find and we'll use find one here since we're only expecting there to be one user with that id and for this we're gonna say uh, id equals whatever the user id that we got in the url parameters was okay so that will give us our user with the corresponding id so the next thing that we need to do is get the notes IDs that are on this user object, which remember are just gonna be an array of IDs uh, of the notes that the user actually owns. And we're gonna to need to actually translate those into the corresponding notes in our DB. So we want this to become an actual database object with all the information for note one, two, three. We want this to become an actual note with all the information for note two, three, four, et cetera. You get the idea. So. The way that we're gonna do this, this is actually a surprisingly tricky thing, and here's why. Our first inclination for this, our first instinct maybe, might be to do something like this and say const notes equals user dot notes dot map. And since we know that each of those is a note ID, we could just say notes db dot find, and you know, uh, maybe that would be find one, and we would find the note by its ID. Now that looks straightforward. However, because this operation here is asynchronous, we have to use a slightly different syntax in order to make this work. Now, when you're doing things like populating data in MongoDB, it's very important that you're familiar with a function in JavaScript called promise.all. Now I'm not gonna go too far in depth with what promises are in JavaScript. That's a topic that could probably span several sections in itself, but basically promises are the mechanism behind using async and await. So the problem with using map in conjunction with an asynchronous function like this one is that what this function actually returns here is a promise. Now a promise in JavaScript is basically just an asynchronous operation that has yet to complete. So what we wanna do is wait for each of these operations to complete before returning our notes array here. Now again, your first inclination here might be to do something like add async and await to these things. And unfortunately, it's not actually that easy, I'm sorry to say. That was my first inclination too when I started doing things like this. It just doesn't work, I'm sorry to say. What we have to do instead is use the promise dot all function, which I just talked about, to basically translate all of the promises that we're returning here into the results that they provide. Now again, I'm not gonna go too much into detail with that. For now, just know that you have to wrap this thing in promise dot all, and that will take care of waiting for all of these requests here to complete, and it will return all of the corresponding notes for those IDs in this variable here. Now we do have to say await here because promise.all itself returns a promise that is only uh, going to be fulfilled when all of the asynchronous operations it represents, in other words, these things here, are fulfilled. I hope I'm not confusing you, by the way. If I am, just ignore this for now. This is just one of the slightly complicated things that we run into when dealing with uh, multiple collections and trying to take IDs from one and translate them into objects in another. Okay, so we have our notes now, and that means we can remove this other line here that we were using before, and now we just have to send those back to the user, which we're doing with this line. So that should be good for our list notes route. If you wanna test this thing, what you can do is we're just going to run our server here by here we go. I'm just going to say npm run dev. And in fact, since we just want to run the server for now, let's just open up our backend directory and say npm run dev in there. And we should be able to test this thing by sending a request to users slash, uh, and then whatever the user ID is we want to access slash notes. So let me just find that user ID real quick by saying Mongo. Again, we're going to say use notes app db and we'll say db.users.find, and we'll just steal the user's ID property here, 
the ID, not the underscore ID. That's just Mongo's automatically assigned ID that we're going to ignore for now. So we're going to take this ID. And what you can do now is if you open up a browser and go to localhost 8080 slash users and then paste that ID slash notes, you should see the information come back for all of the notes that the user owns. Okay. And that's how we rewrite our list notes endpoint to take into account our new concept of ownership in our application. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've converted our list notes route over to take ownership into account in our database, let's do the same thing for the rest of our routes. So what this is gonna look like, we're going to go into here, we're gonna open up create note route, update note route, and delete note route, and we're going to update these as well. Now, one thing that we're not gonna do currently, this won't happen until a little bit later in our development process, we're not currently going to put safeguards in place to stop a user from, you know, sort of hacking our server by providing the wrong ID, right? For our list notes route that we just created, a user could quite easily send a request with the wrong ID to this route and get all of their notes and be able to read those. And this is something that we're going to take a look at later on once we actually incorporate those kind of things more deeply into our full stack application. So, for now, we're going to be ignoring those things, but that's just something to keep in the back of your mind that we still need to do. So starting off with our create note route here, just like we did with our list notes route, we're probably gonna to want to modify the path of this one a little bit to fit in with our RESTful convention. So we're gonna say slash users slash user ID slash notes, and that will basically be used to signify that we're adding a new note to this user with the ID that we're providing here, okay? And that's not a strict necessity, but it will make it easier for now, which is kind of the reason why I'm doing it here. So what we need to do in this endpoint is in addition to creating this new note and inserting it into the notes DB, we also need to take the ID of that newly generated note and add that to the user who just created it. Okay, so essentially what that's gonna look like we're gonna to need to get the user's ID from this path, uh, from this URL parameter here by saying const user ID equals request.params. And then we're going to need to assign this randomly generated UUID to a new variable so that we can use it in multiple places. We're gonna say const new note ID equals UUID. And then we can say UUID new note ID and everything else with the note will work exactly the same as before, except now we can add this new note ID to the user's document in MongoDB. So after we've inserted the new note, the next thing that we're gonna do here is we're going to add that ID to our user's document by saying await users DB, and we're going to import that. It's automatically imported for me up at the top. And we're gonna say users DB dot update one, and what we're gonna do is find the user whose ID matches the user ID URL parameter, and then we're gonna specify the updates, which will look like this. We're gonna say push, and basically what this push operator does is it allows us to add an item to an array on this document that we're finding here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that we wanna push this new note ID onto the notes array, right? The notes property of this user. So what that looks like in MongoDB is we say notes, and then we say new note ID, and that will take care of pushing that new note ID onto the notes array of the user with this corresponding user ID. Okay, and since we're already just sending back the new note itself, we don't really need to change anything else with this route. Uh, we will need to make corresponding changes on the front end, which we'll do later on, but for now, that should be fine. And if you wanna test this, you can always open up Postman and do so. Okay, but for now, we'll just leave it this way and hope for the best later on. So let's move over to our update note route. 
And actually, I'm realizing for this one that we're not going to need to make any changes. If we wanted to, we could say path slash users slash user ID slash node slash node ID, but generally that's considered bad form because it's just kind of ugly, right? There's too many IDs and you can just as easily refer to a note by its ID in this way. Okay, so that helped us in our create note route adding the user ID, but here, not so much. So let's close our update note route. We don't need that right now. And in our delete note route, we are gonna need to make one important change. And that is when we delete this note from the notes collection, we're gonna need to also delete that notes ID from the user's notes array, right? Because what'll happen otherwise is inside our list notes route, uh, the user will still have an ID of a note that no longer exists, right? Let's say that we delete note two, three, four. And basically that route will try and find a note corresponding to two, three, four. It won't find anything and that could potentially cause errors down the line, right? If we uh, get undefined return for this or something like that. Who knows what could happen? Basically, we just want to avoid that, so let's delete that note ID when we delete the note, okay? So what that's gonna look like is once we've deleted the note, we're going to say, oops, there we go. And first, we're gonna need to actually import the users DB here. We're gonna say await users DB dot update one. We're gonna want to update the user with that ID. And here's where things get a little bit tricky because we currently don't know the ID of the user, right? There's nothing inside of here that, um, that would suggest what the user's ID is. So we could add the user ID to the path here and you know, say users slash user ID slash note slash note ID. But again, that's a little bit of a pain. So what we're gonna do instead is add a property to each of the notes in our database that will contain the ID of the user that created it, okay? So what that's gonna look like, let's open up a shell again. I already have one open here. We're gonna say db.users, or sorry, db.notes.update, okay? And we can do update many here if we want to. And we're gonna want to update all of our notes to have the ID of our user here. And we already have the user's ID, so we're just going to copy that. And what we're gonna do is we're going to set a new property on each of our notes, which will be called created by. And that's going to be the ID of the only user in our application currently, which uh, we just got from up above. So that should take care of our problem that we're dealing with in our delete note route right now. And if we hit enter, we should see now that two notes were modified, right? Modified count should be two. and what you should see if you say db.notes.find.pretty is you should see that both of our notes now have a created by property which contains the ID of the user that created them. Now, this serves two purposes. First of all, it allows us to access the ID of the user that this note belongs to when we wanna do things like delete it. And the second thing is that in the future, if we want to do things like display the email of the user that created a given note, we'll just be able to populate that created by property, right? We'll be able to say, find a user with that ID and get their name and basically return that from our server so that our front end will be able to display that easily. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is instead of saying delete one, we're gonna say find one and delete. And this is similar to uh, the find one and update function that we saw earlier. Find one and delete, we'll just find a document in our MongoDB that matches a given criteria and return it while deleting that document from the database. So, you know, basically we have to do something with that data once we've made that call. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna say const result equals await notes DB dot find one and delete. That result should contain the note that was deleted. So we can say const deleted note equals result dot value. And now that we have the deleted note, we can say users db dot update one. And we now know the ID of that user. So we can say ID deleted note dot created by. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove the notes ID from this users 
document. And the way that we do that is similar to the push method, except we use the pull method. Okay, so pull in MongoDB will basically remove an item from uh, an array if that's the property of a document in MongoDB. So we can say pull, and we're gonna say that we want to remove the notes ID from this user's notes property by saying pull notes, and we're gonna say deleted note.id. Okay, so we're removing the notes ID again from the notes property of our user with this ID that we got from the note itself. A little confusing at first, but that should do it. And another thing that we are gonna have to do is go back to our create note route now and add that created by property to the new note when we insert it into the database. So we already have the user's ID, so adding this property won't be hard at all. We'll just say created by user ID. And that will take care of inserting that into the database whenever a user makes this request. All right, so let's test these endpoints now with a piece of software like Postman. What I'm gonna do is open that up. And I'm gonna delete this thing here. What we're gonna do is we're going to test out creating a note. Okay, I'm just going to say dismiss. We're gonna say post. And the URL here is going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8080 slash users slash, and then we're gonna use that ID that we had from before, so just let me find that again. Um, here we go, the created by ID. We're gonna use that and we're going to put that inside this URL and we're gonna say slash notes, right? So we're creating a new note on the user with this ID. And then for the request body, we're going to replace this stuff that we had there from a previous video. And instead, we're just gonna say title. And the title here will be equal to something like uh, note created from Postman. Okay, and we should be able to just click send now and see that this works. Actually, let me make sure that the server is running. Yep, sure enough, it looks like it is. We didn't make any syntax errors, fortunately. So let's click on send. And what we should see as a response is our new note that's been created. We should see this created by property, which is equal to the user's ID, which we included in the URL parameter up here. We see the correct title. We see a newly generated ID. And that's that. Now, if you want to actually list those notes, you can just say get, and you can keep this thing the same, right? It'll be users slash ID slash notes. And if we click send, you should be able to see all of the notes that belong to that user, including the one we just created, which is this note created from Postman object here. And notice again that that has all the correct properties set on it. Now, the last one that we're gonna test here is gonna be the delete endpoint, and we'll see if this one is correct or if we need to make some adjustments there. What we're gonna do is say delete, and we're going to say that we want to delete this note that we created from Postman. So what we're gonna do is copy the ID property, and that is ID, not underscore ID. Just ignore that one for now. We're gonna copy that ID. We're gonna say delete slash notes slash, and then paste that ID. Right, that's the uh, path that we set up for this. And what we're gonna do now, you can even delete this body if you want since we don't need it. We're gonna click on send and we should see this okay response. So now if we go to one of the requests that we made before, which was get slash users slash blah, 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 right, the list endpoint, and we click send again, we should see that that note that we created is now deleted after that request. So it looks like all of our endpoints are still working and they're now taking ownership of those notes into account. So we should be free to add more users to our application later on. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. A little while ago, we saw the basics of adding Firebase Auth to our front end, and while users can now log into our application, our front end remains still only about halfway integrated with Firebase Auth. For example, while the user can log in and that will immediately take them to the home page, 
They can also log out and still go to the home page, right? There's not really any route protection in that uh, in that sense. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at how to do today. We're going to be seeing how to incorporate the finer points of user authentication into the front end of our note sharing application. So that's our basic plan of attack here. Let's jump right in.